Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to my speedrun to the Crystal League on chess.com. So to give you guys some context, just as I set up an unrated three minute challenge. Basically, I'm currently in the Silver League. I haven't played any games yet. I have three days left to play some games and to try to qualify for the Crystal League. And the way you get that is by winning as many games as possible online. So you can see here I'm playing 1175 for the first game and you know, he's letting me get in this H pawn hack attack. It makes sense that given I get points every game I win, obviously I'm going to try to win as quickly as possible against each of these guys. So uh, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, I mean, H5, H4 obviously is not completely sound, but most guys pre-move to bishop g2, and then you get like h4 and you get the nice attack. It's going knight c3, and I shouldn't have played d4, because after d takes, then it's likely that the queens get traded, and that will make the game a lot longer to actually turn into a win. But yeah, it goes bishop e4, so now it kind of works out, I guess. And uh, yeah, I've got bishop g4 coming as well with knight f3, and not letting me draw the arrows for some reason. Used to be able to draw the arrows on this, but maybe I can't in the old version of uh, live chess. So rook g4, let's spice up the position. Managed to lift my rook into the game in a funny way. With rook h4, rook g4. Actually, I think I know why I can't draw the arrows. It's because I'm playing on the old version of uh, of live chess on chess.com, which doesn't let you draw the arrows. So after this game, I'm going to switch back to the other, other version. And well, it'll be a more fun experience for you guys. Uh, and you can see my opponent is not really managed to develop his pieces that well and feels like I should have some tactic, but since I don't see it, let's just play something like e5 and maybe go bishop a3, bishop b4, all that kind of good stuff. Because bishop b4, you yeah, had ideas like knight d5, but for some reason he's very allergic to the bishops. He's like, I can't have any bishops on the board. I love my knights. The knights are my favorite piece. It's okay, a5, a4, let's attack their king. Knight 2, he is giving me the option to take, but then rook f1 gives an attack on my king. So I'm going to just play queen to b4 and go for a4 and open up his king that way. He wants to try and queen his pawn, but I'm going to be in time to go rook h8 and cover it. So not really a big deal in a uh, middle game position. One good thing about it is it does at least get my rook away from the b file. So it does keep his king kind of safe. So yeah, once again, it's my first game and already my opponent... I think he's probably playing better than 1100 because it's not like he's blundered any material or anything at this stage. Of course, as soon as I say, he's probably going to blunder something, but he's got all his pieces defended and d4 also probably is a very good move here. I think I'll go rook g7, just continue with the plan of getting this pawn on h7, like just taking it and being a pawn up. Because as long as I don't allow some sort of mate on my king, it's probably going to be all right here. One thing I do have to be careful is after d5, fe5, I won't be able to take on h7 right away because it'll be able to take and play a queen d8 mate at the end. So that's the main thing you have to watch out for at this kind of point. Uh, well, let's see what he does. I mean, objectively speaking, his position might actually be quite decent when we like d5 or f4 and just trying to open up my king at any price. But I don't think he's going to do that. I mean, normally I wouldn't trade the queens against much lower rate player if I'm trying to beat them quickly, but here it just makes sense when I'm up a pawn and when I have the bishop pair and when his king is also very exposed. Because if I can get a rook on the back rank like this, then suddenly that can create some real mating potential against his king. Obviously he's not going to take, he's going to probably play rook d1, but now I go rook h2 and I can start attacking some of his weaknesses. So he takes, I'll go rook h1 and get the attack rolling. I should have played bishop b4 when it pinned knight, but this is still fine. Uh, I mean, he can't take it because I'm going to have rook g1, so knight e2, but... Now, okay, my position is pretty safe. It's kind of a funny structure to start because I have these doubled pawns on f6, f7, double pawns on c5, and on, uh, what's the square, on c7. Uh, bishop f5, not the most precise because it does have knight d5. But, okay, even though he wins a pawn, the rising position is still very good for me. But it's taking a long time to win. Again, this seems to happen whenever I, like, I record these videos that if I don't record the video, they seem to lose a lot more quickly. Whereas if I record the video, they seem to take a long time and lose on time in most of the games uh, as such. But yeah, this one obviously not the best start. Like I definitely didn't play, I think, all that well because otherwise I think I would have won a lot more quickly. I probably made a lot of mistakes. Like I'm going to actually do have a little game and guess how many mistakes it'll show. I'm going to try I made five mistakes. Oh, I'll take two blunders and five mistakes. That's going to be my guess. Uh, maybe I'm being a bit harsh on myself, but we're going to find out soon enough. Or not, because it doesn't show in this version. 
So let's go to the new version of, uh, of this. If I click on play here rather than live chess. I think this, uh, this should be good. I can just check to make sure that things are all good on our end. Yeah, it still looks, still looks pretty much the same. Uh, maybe I can, just going to adjust something, but I think it's okay. Anyway, let's, uh, let's play a game. Let's play another unrated game. Hopefully this one I can try to win a little bit more quickly than the last one. Uh, also, yeah, I guess it's a moment why I'm waiting game to share some news about what I've seen happening in the chess world. You know, I had the US Championship going on recently. Oh, wow, I'm playing a rated game. I thought I'd set an unrated thing, but automatically set rated. Oh, well, I guess I'm playing a rated game. One nice thing is I have been recently working on a book on the London system. So I guess it gives me a chance to potentially practice some of those ideas. Hopefully he plays b6 and falls into the trap, but I'm expecting he'll probably take on d4. But no, he falls in a knight c3 trap, and yeah, he's going knight b5, which I was actually just looking at just earlier today. I was writing about this, funnily enough. Uh, I wish I could hide this, but I don't know how to, so I'll just leave it and focus on the position. Remember, I had this game against, uh, what's his name? Uh, it was against uh, Al Martinez Alcantara with knight a6, where I remember playing knight d6, but yeah, he blunders with this, and, and now he's just dead. I actually won with this way against Aman Hamilton in a blitz game like uh, many years ago. But this is exactly actually what I was covering in my book. There was this game between like a 2000 player and an 1800 player that actually reached this exact position. So I was literally just analyzing this earlier today. And as a result, basically gives me a very fast win against this 2700 guy. So that's a pretty good feeling. I mean, to be fair, I shouldn't count my chickens just yet. I should still play some good moves, of course. But objectively, position is just lost for black. If he goes bishop d6, okay, queen c6, now you go queen d3. I've got like bishop e6 ideas and stuff. And of course, you can always just take the rooks. Like queen g2, I probably just cast along and just say that he's going to lose a lot of material in the coming moves. So bishop d6, uh, okay, let's think about it. I think the best move is just to play knight takes a8 because bishop b4, I have c3, and he's still having to deal with the fork on d6 and on uh, h8 here. Uh, so yeah, that's still picking up a good amount of material. Like we can material, I'm already up in exchange, notwithstanding I'm about to collect some more material. So bishop b4, I'll just go c3 and ask him what his next move is. Probably rook f8, but then maybe I even have knight e5 and I can try to keep the knight before taking the bishop maybe. Something like that feels like it has a lot of potential. So, I mean, he's just losing a lot of material at the end of the day. I think in a classical game, Black would probably resign, but you know, in Blitz, you shoot your shot, you try to make the best of it, even if it's just losing completely. Bishop c3, I'll probably just go queen takes. Here, I'm, I'm just going to play for initiative. I'll just cast along, just keep all the frets to his position, make sure all my pieces are in the game. And knight e4, I think just knight d6 is the most clinical. Ah, he has bishop d6. Okay, fortunately, I think I'm still winning this, but it's not anywhere near as simple as it was. Because queen f2 and... So he's threatening mate here, but I'm threatening mate on c7, and thankfully for me, he resigns. So yeah, kind of weird that that was the first game that counted, thought the previous one would count. Is that something that's changed? Like, have they set so that you can't uh, play uh, unrated, like, and get points? Let's test this and find out if I just set to an unrated game. Nice, I got like eight points for the win. But okay, let's test this and actually find out. Do I get points on the Crystal League if I play unrated, or don't I? I think the answer is no, but I'm going to play one more game just to check. And also, I guess it gives you a chance to see maybe how to win against like this sort of player of this rating. Like, let's say you're rated, I don't know, 1400, and you find it really hard to see even survive against 1600s. Well, you may find useful to see how I play it. But it looks like this guy is not here. And I'm not going to abort, because if I abort too many times, it will sort of block me from playing. Uh, I think Lee Chess has this feature as well. But anyway, we'll find out at some point. Yeah, I was talking about some news, like about the US Championship, that the, all the games ended in draws today, but it was kind of an interesting round for me, and in I saw there was this ending between Swish against Lenderman, uh, which ended in a draw, but I think Swish was winning that rook ending if he played it the best way, but I think he misplayed it and ended up just being a draw in the end. Um, I think the other leaders are... I'm trying to remember, I know Wesley So is one of the other leaders, and the other one is... Uh, name is already escaping me. I remember Ray Robson was previously leading, but I think, yeah, he lost to Caruana in round seven, and then he, uh, yeah, was not leading anymore. Yeah, I wish I remember who the third player in the lead was, but I unfortunately do not recall this. Uh, so, 
Anyway, uh, Annie else in the women's championship, Carissa Yip is leading with six out of eight, having a very strong tournament. So, uh, okay, hopefully he plays and we'll find out if, uh, yeah, if these games count towards the Crystal League or if they only sets, I can play rated. Like, maybe they did that so that, uh, you know, if, uh, so maybe they thought I was doing, like, getting a lot of points against sorry players, so they want to try to make it fairer. Or that, you know, if at least if you're going to play, like, rated, uh, like, against lorried players, at least you're kind of risking the rating to get points on the league. I mean, it has its logic, to be fair. Bishop c5 maybe wasn't the best move in the position, but I think it's okay. The reason it might not be best, you can maybe take, go d4 or something, but even then, I think the rising IQP position is okay. Now I'm going to release the tension and go a5 and just say that my bishop is kind of better than his. See, I can now highlight stuff. You know, it's like I'm a natural artist, a natural performer. I love, you know, uh, being able to draw artworks and create masterpieces on the chessboard. So, uh, yeah. Also, yeah, the other news I wanted to share. Well, if we round up the tournament news as I take the pawn I didn't see for five moves beforehand. That, oh, the other tournament that's going on that's pretty strong at the moment is the... Russian Championship and all the games again ended in draws today, which is kind of funny because they were fighting quite a lot before this round. And there are uh, the winner is well, not the winner, but the player leading Tom is Nikita Vitugov, who I believe is on four out of six, if I remember correctly. And I already kind of forgot who was following him. I think it was Alexienko and some other player I've forgotten. Okay, the good news is the game actually does count towards the league, so but it only counts if I played in this area. So, okay, let's uh, let's find another opponent. Uh, so here away we go. Uh, okay, so two two hundred guy, and okay, I guess you know what I might try to play a reverse London setup against this guy because some have been working on quite a bit lately, and you know why not play knight c six and kind of see if this actually kind of works with colors reversed like h five h four. Probably objectively it's just garbage, but you know I'm in a kind of punting mood today. Let's say so. Let's go for it. He can take if he wants, but uh, I could go h three or h takes g three. I'm going to play h takes g3 and maybe try to go for some queen knight bishop h3 kind of Nakamura style and just go for a big attack. Like in blitz chess, even though this is probably objectively not the best way to play it as black, in blitz it can be very practically tricky to deal with this. That being said, probably e4 is objectively quite good for white and to his credit he does play that way. But still I think the position is quite decent for me. I just have to be a little bit careful about my king position here. King c7 maybe goes bishop f4. So I might be better off playing rook e8 and then putting the king back on c8 instead. I chose e8, not d8, because I want to put some pressure on this pawn here. Bishop f4 is a good move. I'm going to play king c8 to anticipate rook d1. Maybe objectively I should play bishop e4 and just give up the bishop pair. Because knight d6 is kind of an annoying check if I let that happen. But bishop e4 is also just such an ugly move to play. So I'm going to go f6 instead. Uh, with the idea that ef6 I've got some bishop e4 or even maybe rook takes e4. Because ef6 bishop e4 I might have been able to check me or something. So we get this position where I can blockade the pawn. Just king to d7. My knight will come to f7. I go g5. And if he's not careful I might just be able to pick up the pawn in fact. So bishop e3 is trying to create some weakness. Actually a6 was superfluous because I could have just played rook 8 and god for this anyway. But still I think it's okay to keep this position solid. As long as he doesn't get something like rook e7, I'm going to be very, very safe here. So rook e1, knight h6. If he takes... Yeah, bishop takes. Uh, maybe I will play just rook takes and just play this. Uh, so, yeah. But this game is not the most convincing. I definitely didn't play the opening in the best way. But now he's given me the option to take the pawn if I want to. And I think I do want to take that pawn, actually. And if it's nothing wrong with grabbing the pawn, then why not just do it? Be greedy, put it in the bank... Hope that it's like, you know, uh, some Dogecoin or Ethereum or some other crypto you guys are a fan of. That it just ends up being massively uh, higher in value in the next year or whatever. Uh, so, anyway, uh, I wish I knew more of the memes. Like, I remember I used to check on, uh, like, Reddit a couple times, like, all the Dogecoin memes and just, like, be amused at how crazy it was. But anyway, I guess we can say that at least for this position, the hype is real for Black. Because, well, he can try to go b5, but if I go rook c8, I can play cb and show that his bishop on c5 is not that well placed. So he's trying to prepare it, but I'm just going to bring my knight in. I can even play bishop d5 at some moment uh, and try to trade off his bishop pair. I don't think I want to do it immediately because bishop h3 might be a bit annoying. But now he's giving me knight d6 and I can try to cover b5 like this. 
and you're covering it with the knight and all. So let's take, and I think he just blundered a pawn, right? Because I can play a takes b5, and my knight is just covering everything, just beautiful. Uh, rook d1, I just go king e7, and yeah, there was one thing also actually I was going to announce as well, like that I saw, it was pretty cool. But I'm going to save it until after this game to keep you guys just a little bit in suspense. Uh, rook e1, I just go king to d7. I could have gone king f7, that might have been better, because rook d1 he can play, but okay, I just move the king back and it's still fine. Doesn't really lose anything. Uh, so, but now I have to figure out, yeah, how do I get out of this potential repetition with bishop d5? I could go rook c5, but bishop b4, he's got a lot of tricks here. I think my best bet might just be to give back... I was going to say give back the pawn, but I just realized for rook d1 I have knight e4, and I can stop bishop e7 that way. And yeah, it gives him the option to take out opposite color bishop ending, but I think with two extra pawns and his king being kind of weak on the light squares, I'm pretty confident I can win that with best play. Once again, I'm playing this like... Well, the game is taking forever to get the points, so... Yeah, my aim to try to win quickly has not really gone to plan. It doesn't seem to in these streams, like I said. It's probably going to be like a meme one day, you know, like years from now when I have way more than like 900 or whatever subscribers. There'll be just meme like, oh, whenever Max plays, try to win quickly. The games are going forever because they end up just flagging uh, in the position. And yeah, and that's how it goes. I was going to play Rook C1, but I might actually go King G6 and kind of improve the King position a bit first. If Rook G8, maybe I'll just go back to F7 anyway and say, well... That was, I have a better idea now. Let's play f5, g4, and try to attack on these uh, on these light squares, because light squares are my domain, and I am threatening a little checkmate here. So king h5, keep the king away from the checks. Rook d1, I probably just go king to g4. And uh, yeah, basically I can swing the rook this way now. That's kind of annoying for him. So let's do that. Maybe I should have gone bishop f3 at some point. But I can still do it like at this point with king e2, so it's all well and good. And I actually win a full rook here, because king e1 I have rook h1, but king d2 I have rook d6, and I pick up the rook that way. I uh, one thing I probably, I didn't mention at the start, but probably should add as well, that this isn't a live video, this is a pre-recorded one, so that's why I'm not replying to your comments to you guys, but always welcome to chat with one another, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Then the comments come in my notifications on, uh, on what's it called. Uh, you know, later on, not all of them, but like some certain comments. But okay, let's pay Benko Gambit, because this is what I normally do, to win quickly against D4 against these guys in these unraid games. But okay, he avoids it with E3, and let's just transpose back into Panov Bot for Nick Karakan, and okay, C5 was a much better move, but I moved too fast. But I can do it the second time around, and that's all well and good. And after D5, Knight E5, I'm going to be able to attack that pawn on C5 with a bishop. Where this is why c5 is a mistake before black wise we managed to stabilize the center like knight f3 bishop b5 and all that good stuff and yeah now he just donates me a pawn uh well thank you i certainly appreciate donations it's not just twitch streamers that get them it seems but anyway uh what else have we got here bishop b5 i could just play knight c6 i think that's what i'm going to do probably bishop d7 was better but i just want to keep some pieces on the board just for the fun of it I can castle rook e8 Bishop 2 out, and you know, I'm just a pawn up with better development at the end of the day. Even moves like Queen B6 and trying to go for this look tempting. But uh, can I go Bishop F2? I believe I can just take Knight E4, Fork, and you know, pick up the, the Bishop and stuff. I could actually have taken the other Bishop with Queen B6 if I wanted to, but I want to take this guy because, well, it leaves his King a bit more open, I think, if he doesn't have the, uh, the Dark Squared Bishop. So... Maybe he's trying to take my queen and didn't realize, didn't realize the king was in check for a moment. If he goes queen e2, I'll just go bishop e6 and make sure my queen is still defending the knight. Otherwise, there's castle rook e8. And the other nice thing about bishop f2 is it doesn't just win a pawn, but it also keeps his king in the open center. So that makes it much easier to attack him that way if he can't castle out of it. Okay, I think, well, it's not technically a blunder, but I do have queen b6. I'm going to take on f3 and hope he blunders queen f3, queen b6. Because that would be a pretty natural sort of mistake to make here as white. Because queen f3 is the sort of positionally most natural move. And yeah, now he blunders this. And well, I can even pre-move queen takes b5 actually. Because uh, he can't defend a bishop and a king at the same time. And getting a lot of players who play very slowly. I mean, to be fair, like it's their best chance to play slowly against me. But it just means it takes a lot longer for me to get the points. 
But okay, he did resign kind of quickly, but I'm going to try to find a different opponent. Try to give a lot of people a chance to play. But yeah, if you're watching this like on YouTube, oh, I'm going to try and challenge me Max now. Then yeah, I'm not, uh, probably not going to be online then. I'll probably be asleep because my sleep pattern's like really crazy lately. But anyway, that's uh, another story. You know, the COVID lockdowns, I think it's something that, you know, we're not getting as much sunlight in our eyes. And so it kind of messed up our circadian rhythms a little bit. At least for me, I mean, I know it's a little bit of an excuse, but that's kind of what the story has been uh, for me. I don't know why I started with Knight F3, but I guess I go D4 and I still get the London, so all well and good. It's crazy how many Londons I've been playing on chess.com lately. Like, at some point, I'm just going to say, nah, I'm just, I can't stand the sight of this London anymore. Like, I've spent, like, too much time on it. I need a break. But I mean, when you spend a lot of time on something, you also kind of you know, start to, I guess, fall in love with it. Uh, Bishop F5 is not a move I've seen before, but I think if I just go E4, that will make the Bishop look a little bit silly. And I'll still get my very nice center. Because the thing is, Knight D2 is kind of a move you want to play anyway in these positions, but normally you play it in the middle game, where you put the Knight on C4 and it's just a very nice square to support like an E5 break in the middle game. But okay, here I got it with a tempo, because this Bishop is going to have to go to an ugly square. Bishop G4, I might even just play F3 and just kind of gain that tempo on the Bishop. And I could go Bishop E2, but the principle is I have more space, so I think it makes sense to not trade the, uh, the pieces. And also, uh, what I find as well in these structures is that the bishop on c8 often really struggles to find a good square. Because if you put on d7, then the knight on b8 can't go there. But if you go to b7, you're hitting this brick wall of g2, f3, e4, d5. So also a pretty ugly square for that piece. This guy is spending a very long time thinking, which I don't know why. I, I don't know, maybe he had a phone call or, you know, it was something like your know, mother over the social saying, you know... Dear son, how dare you play these stupid games? Why don't you go do your homework? Okay, I'm like, I'm joking, but yeah, it looks like you resigned and wasn't why I was playing to get a quick win, but hey, I'll take it. I mean, zero mistakes, zero blunders, but it was a five move game or six move game, whatever it was. I already lost count. Actually, technically it was a seven move game. This guy disconnect, looks like he disconnected. Uh, oh yeah, so the other news I wanted to share that I kind of observed, I saw this really cool thing today with this uh, 100k scholarship, uh, chess scholarship fund by uh, Gotham Chess, aka International Master Levy Rosman. That was pretty cool to see, you know, giving back to the uh, the chess community like that. Whereas like the, for basically for the best sort of chess school programs, like K to eight, uh, like scholastic chess programs, that they would sort of get like a grant between five uh, grand to, uh, to six, five, five grand to 15 grand. So yeah, that was pretty cool. And I thought, well, if he's going to be generous, then I'll be generous as well. And yeah, so that was, uh, well, I guess another reason I'm doing a bit of a longer video because, well, I felt like doing, let's say, I mean, stream is not really a live stream, but it's kind of like a pre-recorded sort of playing stream. So uh, yeah, because if I do it like a live stream, I sort of have to stick to some kind of schedule and my sleep pattern is really crazy. So as like doing the recording is kind of fun that way, even if it's not the same live interaction with you guys. But yeah, C4 is kind of a very instructive move to, activate this diagonal for the bishop because yeah he's giving up the exchange because if he had played like knight h4 i'd go pawn e3 and actually he could go knight e4 there so he'd still be in the game but i guess g5 traps a knight so yeah it's kind of bad for him anyway i'll go queen d1 just to make it hard for him to develop the uh the queen side i mean he has to go like b4 bishop b2 if he wants to free the rook but that's kind of slow at the same time but it's still probably his best move now f5 just kind of feels right to me because it's not that easy for him to keep this uh, this knight defended with the queen. Like if queen g6, yeah, I just take. You had to go queen f4 or probably queen h5. I want to try and mate me, but okay, I can even play queen g4 to show off. But bishop f6 is the safe way to do it, and I can still play queen g4 later to force the queens and hopefully force resignation as well because that's what we really want to see here. That they resign fast and you know you can knock them off quickly. I mean, it reminds me of when, uh, you know, Joseph Blackburn in the, like, 1900s or whatever, or, like, in late 19th century, early 20th century, he had this system known as the Blackburn Shilling Gambit. You know, it's a trap that you guys probably, quite a few of you know, because probably in a million YouTube videos on it by now. But basically, he came up with this trap as a way to try to win games as quickly as possible, because he would play these games with odds that if he got a shilling... So if he uh, won the game, then he would get a shilling. And back then, you know, the currency was a lot less inflated than it is nowadays. So actually a shilling actually was worth quite a bit at that time. 
And so, yeah, basically, Cambridge trapped the line, like, win games really quickly in, I don't know, like, uh, 10 moves or... I don't know, so I think it's like a 9-move trap, actually, like 9-move checkmate for Black if they fall for all of the trap moves. Um, so, it didn't do that to win quickly, but, yeah, basically, uh, well, obviously, I'm not, like, playing for money here, but sort of a similar kind of concept. They're not going to play, like, complete rubbish moves, but I want to, yeah, at least, uh, well, come up with lines that are somewhat tricky to, if they don't know what they're doing. I can get a very big advantage very quickly, and B5 actually it's a move I decided not to cover in my in my book, at least at the time of uh, recording this, because I thought the chance of someone rated, let's say, you know, below 1800 facing B5, I think is just very, very low. And if they do, I mean, I don't think it's such a move that you're exactly like going to end up in a bad position just because I played B5. But I may end up changing my mind, including like in a footnote or something. But yeah, it's a move where you're at least trying to surround this pawn. So there's a certain logic to it, at least. I think, for a second, I thought he blundered queen e2 and d6, but I should go d6 first and then queen e2. And then his king is going to be stuck in the center. And yeah, he just blundered a piece. And I don't can see, like, why does d5, f3, e4? It's just very effective and I was winning very quickly. I'm not going to play a rematch because against two 200 guy, it'll take a lot of time to get points. And finally, say I get a two 100 player. Okay, let's try Scandinavian this time. And go knight f6. I normally wouldn't do it against a player this, of this rating. But, you know, let's uh, let's see how it goes. I'm going to play it Grunfeld style. Because I did that in a game, I think, on an earlier stream. Or at least when I was playing. And it worked out really, really well. Because, I mean, they get these doubled pawns. And, you know, you've got some nice pressure. Queen a5. All that good stuff. DC5 is grabbing a pawn. But he's also letting me push my pawns forward in the center. And an extra pawn is not really that meaningful when you've got like 4v2, but you can't really create a pass pawn with a majority. Well, unless you win the pawn on b7, but that's saying not going to be so easy. Yeah, e5 is maybe a little bit sloppy by me, because now he can uh, put the queen on d6. So I'm going to play queen h4. For some reason, it took me a million years to think of this move, but it kind of makes sense to activate the queen, and you know, now I can play bishop a6, rook d8, and so then I'm getting quite a real initiative here. I guess he could go queen f3 and hit this pawn maybe, and that's what he does. But perhaps I could just go rook d5 and just keep the, the pressure. Because if I get an f5 and e4, I think I'm just quite substantially better. So he's probably going to go rook d1, rook d8. At least I'm thinking rook d8. And if rook takes d5... I mean, rook d5, rook d1 is very solid for him. Unless I can go e4. That actually is a very clever trap. Because I was thinking cd5 alternatively, but... Yeah, he's going for this instead, and now I think... Hang on, he's just blundering fe4. I'm just winning a piece, right? I'm pretty sure I'm just winning a piece. Because rook e4, I can even play queen takes e4 and go rook d1, and I've got a really nice back rank, mate. This is what happens when I watch a million Gotham chess videos. I'm now drawing arrows like him as well. Uh, so, yeah, and I've obviously bishop h4, ef3, and if he tried to defend the bishop, I just move the queen to some square. And he is not resigning, even though he is absolutely and utterly dead lost. So, yeah, I mean, I can just bring the bishop over and just attack his weaknesses. Okay, so now he resigns. Funny, actually, I won that game in, like, less than two minutes. It's a good feeling to win quickly. Because in the previous game, playing, like, lower rate players is taking forever to win. Uh, oh, yeah, also, I guess I should mention, because he's on YouTube. You know, I normally say it for, but, yeah, if you are enjoying this video, leave a like. You know, it helps others to see the video. And, you know, if you are new to this channel, maybe this is your first video of mine you've watched or you've only seen a few of them, uh, then, yeah... Definitely consider subscribing and you'll get more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. Uh, so yeah, actually I'm getting pretty close to 1k subscribers. So, I mean, the day when I actually get to 1k, like I'll actually be able to earn revenue from and from monetization, like with ads and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the thing is you're going to be seeing the ads anyway, unless you have a YouTube premium like me. So it's not like it makes a difference, except that I actually earn money when I'm over 1k subs. I mean, I started this channel in 2017, and yeah, it's like, be a very long journey, but yeah, that's sometimes how it goes. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to talk too much more about it, because like, as soon as I get like attached to the outcome with these things, I just start to like, get really discouraged when the progress doesn't come as quickly as I feel it should. Whereas if I just kind of go with the flow and just like do it because I enjoy it, I think that's probably healthier in the long term. And probably you guys also notice the difference, like if I'm, if, like, I'm doing a video because I have to versus, you know, Doing a video because I sort of feel like it and feel passionate about it at that time. Uh, so, okay, so I haven't really been talking much about the position for the last moves, but you know, 95, a decent enough move. But 
even though he gets the bishop pair after knight takes d7, the thing is that his king is, is uncastled, he has no real development, and the bishop pair is kind of a long-term advantage in the sense that it only really starts to become a factor once you have all the other pieces developed already. And obviously white is a very long way from that at this stage. So I'm going to go rook e8, I'm going to go knight d5 and most likely and try to open up this file. Against bishop c4, yeah, why not gain some space with b5, hit it with a tempo. And uh, well, it depends where it goes, but let's just play c4. Grab a lot more space than your queen e4 and would allow me to win the queen. But otherwise, you know, I have this vice-like grip, vice-like grip on e4 and c4. I think I'm mixing up my language, I mean, pin to like grip, but you get the idea that, you know, he can't take the pawn, but if he doesn't take the pawn, then yeah, I, his bishop's just completely trapped in this position, and well, basically white is losing. Let's go rook e5, let's bring more pieces into the attack with a tempo. Uh, queen h4, I don't think I'm quite trapping the queen, but it feels very close. But I'm just going to play, I'm going to play rook e8, just build up the position a bit more. Castles, I'll think about how to attack his king. Maybe I go rook e6 and rook h6. That would be very creative. Let's do that. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's objectively the best thing. f5 and f4 might objectively be stronger, but I kind of like the idea of lifting the rook. So f4 is kind of interesting because he wants to go for this sort of thing. But he's also giving me like rook f5 if I want it, which I think I do I uh, want actually. I can go bishop c5 and give a check if I want to. But yeah, I mean... This position is not so easy to actually put away, I think. I'm sure it's winning for black, but I have to be a tiny bit careful. Well, at least he played g3. After g4 now, it's kind of relatively straightforward. Get him up a pawn, he's playing out all of these pieces. Like, what are you going to see, like, what grandmasters do? Is that they make sure that all of their pieces are in the game and that they're on good squares. And they therefore try to develop the piece as quickly as possible for the most part. And it can sort of see my opponent hasn't managed to do that, and that's why he's lost the game effectively out of the opening, even though he was playing with the white pieces. So bishop c5. I'm probably going to play h6 just to make sure I don't get back rank mated, even though knight f4 is probably a lot more clinical, or rook f6 and bring it in. But I can still do these ideas later. This is actually a really funny structure, because this bishop and rook are completely framalized at this point, to quote a, uh, a little Goosebumps reference. So king h3, I mean, yeah, this is just kind of funny now. Let's go with queen d5, threaten mate on g2. Queen Drew Frago, Bishop D6, and White is completely gone at this point. Uh, so yeah. Actually, there's another thing as well, like while I'm waiting for this guy to resign, make to like a funny little anecdote. Because like I play four player chess like quite a bit in the spare time, like trying to get to number one on all the different ratings there. Rating number one on solo, but I'm trying to get number one on the champions as well. And the thing with four player chess though is that if you have an opposite or a player who just plays solely to make you lose, and you're not trying to win a game, but just playing only to make you lose then you end up losing rating points even if you didn't make any mistakes whatsoever. And obviously it gets very frustrating after a while, so at some point I just start like having like all these, because the normal swear words are kind of cut out, like they were censored, so I kind of like creative like ways to shorten it, like shorthand to like still convey my frustration. So then I think that Chess of Comrades, like they updated the sort of censored words and added some new ones because to sort of deal with some of my creative attempts to get around it. So that was kind of a funny little anecdote that in a way I probably influence the you know the censoring so if you see like some new word use like hang on that wasn't sense before then yeah you can probably thank me at least to some small extent at least in four player chess so knight bd7 okay let's talk about position because this knight c3 is a really nice trick i actually have decided to recommend in my london book at the time of writing and this is sort of the reason why that if they don't play knight d7 you have this very easy bishop h6 h4 h5 and the attack on the king kind of plays itself but if knight d7, you go e5 and bishop h6 anyway. And they can't play d takes e5, because if they do that, they can't play knight takes because the pin on the d file. And if they go bishop takes, then you've got bishop f8 ideas, at least if I remember it correctly. Unless they have some wacky idea where you go bishop f4 and win the queen. But I think I go... Yeah, that actually could be kind of a genius idea. So I'm just going to take g7 and uh, just not lose the queen as such. That would have been kind of embarrassing. I was talking about my book and then blunder a queen in nine ten moves but i saw it in time it means i'm maybe not playing all that badly today after all so c6 knight f3 maybe f4 is objectively better but i want to try and go for some queen a6 knight g5 at some moment that's kind of what i'm hoping for but yeah he goes queen c7 he can meet queen h6 with knight f5 so it's not not so clear uh yeah now already regretting the move i played it was kind of dumb but okay queen g5 
He does have f6, but it does at least give me a bishop c4 check with tempo. So it's still a little bit of a concession for him. Uh, I mean, he could also just play knight f5, and I'm not sure why I put the queen on g5, but I guess I go g4 and, you know, just do attacking stuff. So he plays knight c5. I mean, now I'm kind of thinking of playing g4 at this point, but I'm allowing f6. Yeah, you can always do this anyway, so this is just kind of ridiculous. Just playing very badly this game. But I think I'm still much better even after making these egregious mistakes. But if f6, yeah, I mean, then it's not so clear. I might have to go knight e4 and try to put a knight in e g5 if he takes on e5 or something like this. Uh, one good thing is at least his piece are kind of stuck at the moment. So that's good news for me. And, you know, knight e g5 is a threat. And if f6, maybe go h4 and just try to force open the file like this. Yeah, f5, not really a move you want to do. Because now I'm threatening mate on h7 and you can't really avoid it, unfortunately. And yeah, he just allows a mate. Okay, so actually it was a very short game. I made in like 17 moves, but because he spent a lot of time, he ended up being like three minutes. So what to do? And yeah, I think I haven't really been keeping track of like what my position is on the leaderboard because... Well, basically the way it works is that you advance to the next rung of the... Uh, or the next league, as it were, basically by doing really well in the previous league. So these guys basically play a lot on chess.com each week. So that's why it's going up quite slowly at first. But as we move up and play more, it will start to improve. I mean, the general idea is if I can get like 200 points every hour, then that's going to be a pretty decent return. But so far, I think I'm way below that because these guys are playing so slowly. So uh, anyway, it's kind of funny. I used to think like it would be so hard to like not talk about the game, but it's actually kind of fun. Like, it's so automatic, I can almost, like, talk about other things and still, like, play moves here. It is uh, a skill I didn't realize I had, but there you go. I learn something new every day, right? I mean, you can even go e4, e5, but I think I'm going to queen c2 and try to attack g4, g5. Just try to mate him quickly. Knight b4 is a good move, actually, because he can go c5, and at least then he's sort of hitting my center, and his position kind of makes sense. But after a3, his position doesn't make sense anymore because, well... He can, I guess, still play c5, but my attack is suddenly very quick here. And I'm not sure if he's seen my threat. Okay, he does actually have knight e4, but I'm not sure if he intended this. It might just be kind of dumb luck that he happens to have this uh, as such. But okay, even here after bishop d3, he's still in big trouble. And okay, I have bishop g8 and our queen h7 mate. I shouldn't premium too quickly because he might troll me with queen h2 just to hope that I play queen h7 or something crazy. So I'm not going to be cocky. I'm going to let him think for two minutes and realize, oh, I'm actually getting checkmated. Okay, it's a little bit harsh. He actually played the move fast and checkmate. As he is from uh, Venezuela. Yeah, I'll play him again. Actually, one thing I can't remember like that. I think Venezuela, I could be wrong on this, but I feel like they won like the most uh, Miss uh, Universe like contests like of all the countries or something, if I remember correctly. Uh, don't ask me how I remember this trivia, but not even sure it's true. Probably someone comment saying, oh, no, Max, I'm an expert of Miss Universe contests and the actual country is this one. But anyway, I guess that way I'll learn something from it either way. So, win-win. Yeah, with f 9 3 a 3 like, this is a very passive setup by White. You can see that his bishop now is stuck, and even this bishop, like, it can go to d3, but still not really doing that much there. Bishop b4 would have been a much smarter move to use the pin, but... Okay, I guess he could go a 3 there, so not all... Not all bad news for me. Yeah, you can sort of see I'm kind of anticipating his move. A bit like captures, try to gain time on the clock. And you know, already lost the tempo moving the bishop twice. Whereas uh, if it was a grandmaster playing, like you wouldn't see a GM for the most part, like move the piece to one square and immediately move it back again without some good reason. Like, I mean, if a6 is played, then sure, the bishop's under attack. So it makes sense to move it again. But yeah, otherwise, like it's not going to make a whole lot of sense for the most part. So... Anyway, I think my plan will just be to take... I was going to say my plan would be to push in the center, but now that he's gone for this, instead of attacking on the king's side, I'm going to just attack his weak pawn on c4, because once I win that, I'm going to be up a pawn and just have a incredibly comfortable position. I'm a little reticent about playing e4, because maybe he gets d4, but then I get in knight e5, knight d3, so... I could have actually done this earlier, but now he's got this wretched bishop f6. You know, it happens so often, I can chess, you know, you come up with some idea and then the instant you realize you had this idea, then on the second time they managed to avoid it. And of course, as I was talking, I played this ridiculous knight a5, missing he can take a free pawn with knight e5. So kind of ironic after talking about this sort of 
frustrating thing that happens to me, then the exact thing happens to him after that. So C5 just take the pawn for free, and well, I got the extra pawn. That's good. But if he had played something like knight d2, I still go b5, and I still win the pawn the pin anyway. So he was kind of in trouble regardless at this point. You know, I think the winning plan in this sort of position will just be to push my majority, like b5, b4, a5. And if it gets to an endgame, then, you know, I just will be, uh, well, in that case, I would just basically have a passed pawn. But instead, he blundered a bishop, and he's just completely and utterly lost at this point. So, uh, yeah, that's the story. I guess imagine like you, someone probably watches and wondering like, what's this? Uh, you know, what's this thing in the background? Like the the power charger. It's like, hang on, you've got like power in this uh, in this area, but of course, it's just a background like general image as such. Like I move my hand or like uh, like this, you can see my hand is like phasing out of existence. So that's the uh, beneath the curtain. That's the magic trick uh, in the story. Oh, wow, I got a four fifty rated player here. Let's see. Uh, if I know it's 450, I've probably gone e5 or d5, but anyway, it is what it is. He's going Rossolimo. Very advanced opening for a 450 player, I have to say. But maybe he's one of these guys like who isn't really 450, like he just threw a bunch of games to make it when he plays unrated, he seems a lot better. Because I remember like years ago, there was this guy I played one time uh, in unrated bullet, right? This rank of like 100 or 200 or something like ridiculous. But he actually played like a 2400 or 2300 rated, uh, rated uh, bl blitz. Or bullet player. It was completely ridiculous. So, uh, yeah. So it's kind of funny what happens. And then there are other times, like when I was first, first playing on chess.com, where I'd play like some 600 raid player. And at that time, like their cheat detection system wasn't anywhere near as good as it is now. So, like, if I was playing some raid below 500, I realized that I was more likely to lose to the 500 rated guy than I was to the 2 300 rated guy. Because all the 500s, like, cheating and unrated, thinking they would get away with it just because it's unrated. So, yeah, it was kind of really weird how. How that played out, but yeah, now chess or combos have much better cheat detection systems. So if someone's rated like 450, then it's probably for a good reason for the most part. So yeah, knight d5 it does hit the knight as well as the bishop, and you know at this level, what a lot of players do is they'll only think, well, what can the knight do that it couldn't do before, and they won't look at the discovered attacks because they just don't see them, and that's kind of shown here with his move d4, which just is bad on a lot of levels because he's also leaving that pawn on pre. And I was actually considering taking it, but I thought, nah, let's just take the knight directly. But taking first probably would have been a tad better for what it's worth. Okay, let's go bishop h3 and play for mate. Because there's a decent chance he doesn't see it, in fact. But if he does, it's still a good move, because I still pick up material in some kind of fashion. So f3. Well, then I might just trade. I mean, okay, he resigned. Because he resigned somewhat quickly, I'll offer him a rematch. Let's see if he accepts it. It'd be nice if he did, because that would mean I would perhaps entry win a more quickly. And I guess I can show well my systems for winning fast against these lower rated players, like with 1e4. I mean, with this, I was originally planning to play mostly, you know, mostly play like London, just because of what I've been writing about. And I'll give it a chance to kind of see a preview of what some things I covered in my book, but uh, which I, it hasn't been published all this time. Like, I haven't finished writing it, but so I am planning on releasing. I haven't decided yet whether I do release it on Amazon Kindle ebooks or whether I just release it on my website. I might end up actually doing a combination of both if it's possible. I'm not sure how it really works. I have to check it out. But I'm hoping in theory I could do something like have a really short version for like Amazon Kindle ebooks and have a longer version of the book maybe for uh, for my website. Because uh, like with the Kindle ebooks, like the way the pricing works, if your price is like I think between $2.99 to $9.99, at least last I checked, it might have changed since then. But basically the way it works is that if it's in that price range, you get like 60, I think it's 66% of the earnings. It might be 60%, I haven't checked it lately. But if it's sort of outside that price range, you only get like 30 or 33% of the of the like total earnings from the sales, something like that. So basically in that sense, you're kind of paying for Amazon to do the marketing for you. But at the same time, like let's say you write a 350 page book and you're charging like $9.90 for it or $9 for it or something like this. Then yeah, obviously like you're putting in a lot of work for something that, well, is uh, not going to earn that much money unless you're like very, very lucky uh, as such. So uh, yeah, so I kind of be thinking in, out loud about uh, about how I'll release it. But anyway, let's uh, let's play a game. I've had this guy a lot of time. This guy that likes to think a lot over his moves. So let's go e5 and okay, in this case, I might even consider playing same setup. I'm thinking of something like this because it's very easy for me to play this kind of thing. 
But instead I print our mouse slip bishop e7, which actually is probably a better move in this, uh, well better is a bit strong, but in this particular sub it kind of works out okay as a useful move. Once again my opponent like is rated 1200, but he's playing a lot better than that so far. Uh, let's play knight f6, knight d7, just playing normally. I'm giving him knight g5, but I guess bishop to c g4 is alright then. Uh, I'll go h6, maybe go g5 and try to hold back f4, kind of playing in a Makoganov kind of spirit. Wii 2, yeah, g5. So he's playing some kind of weird moves. I mean, queen d2 doesn't really make a lot of sense, because, well, I could even just take here, and I mean, I go knight d7, and he's just got all these weaknesses, like d3, b3 are backward, d4 and b4 are holes for my knights, potentially. And, yeah, I mean, he doesn't really have any sort of pawn break, unless, you know, he plays f4 or something, but... Yeah, I mean, I can just play b6, f6, just really shut out his pieces on the uh, dark squares, you know, b6. And and in terms of my middle game plan, maybe I just play king f7. I mean, a5 is just a mistake because b5 and the knight gets kicked away, and I just completely kill his knight like this. And, well, my idea was to play like this, and... Okay, I don't think he can do this. Well, yeah, he just blundered that this was on. He actually could have played, uh... He could have played this move of, uh... What was it? Of b4, and he actually does get the piece back technically, because he has queen b4, and... I mean, he's still in a bad position, but this was better than what happened, at least. And the game actually ended in, like, one and a half minutes, so I feel good about that. <clears throat> I kind of realize if I talk like this loudly for the whole stream, I'm going to, like, lose my voice very quickly. So maybe I can try speaking a little softly, or, you know, just not talking as much, and focusing more on the game, just to preserve my voice. So, standard London stuff. And okay, queen a5 is a bit of a pointless move. The queen doesn't really do anything on this square. I can still play my usual London moves like knight d2, bishop d3, castle h3, and, well, I just have a better position, basically. Like, normally in these positions, black should play b6 and bishop to b7, because you'll notice here that his bishop on c8 is really stuck at the moment, and he's spending a lot of time moving the queen early, but the result is he's also losing a lot of time because I'm playing very useful moves while he's moving his queen and his queen's kind of getting kicked all over the place as well which is nice for me. Knight d6 is kind of a tempting move just to not let him play d5 and in the worst case I can at least get the bishop pair uh, like so. Rook e8 maybe I just castle it. Okay so he blunders the exchange well thanks mate. Uh, queen g2 rook g1 now he's losing even more material because his queen is under attack and yeah, bishop g7, I just am completely killing him. Let's play him again, because he's actually playing a bit more quickly now. Now, let's go for some hack setup, like e5. Like, knight 6 is really good if you know they're going to play, uh, like, King's Indian attack, because it lets you play appearance with colors reversed, and for the heck of it, I'm just going to play h5 and h4, and play it as an exchange sack, because I don't think he's going to defend very well against it. So, uh, actually, gh4, I might not want to play rook takes, but take with the bishop. So, I'm not going to pre-move, but in terms of actually could have. I mean, objectively, this sack is just complete rubbish, like knight f3, and white is just substantially better. Because he's already castled into the attack, and, you know, with moves like e4, I suddenly have very serious threats against h2. And yeah, after e4, I think I'm already just winning, unless I miss something incredibly obvious here. Uh, but yeah, if the knight moves, I have a queen h2 mate, and if the knight doesn't move, I take the knight for free. It's a win-win either way. I mean, the best move is probably to play h4. But that's also kind of weakening the king. Like, I could even play f6 and just leave both the pieces hanging, which would be kind of funny here. At least I think I can, unless I miss something like queen d5. But okay, blundered mate. Nice getting some quick wins against this guy. Man, I'm tempted to kind of troll him with h4 at some moment. Uh, or, actually, I know what I'll do. I'm going to do the same idea like knight c3 and play for e4. And just get this dominant center. And it's great to see he doesn't really know what he's doing, like playing c5. And yeah, oh, I had e5. e5 was winning. Now I have this wretched Franco Pannoni. Like, I actually literally have nightmares from the Franco Pannoni. Because it's a sort of everything that's complete and utter rubbish. I mean, you've got this lack of space. You're behind in development. Your king has not castled. And somehow, like, when you get this position, like, it feels like, okay, king f8. And their position looks so dumb at this moment. And yet there's no easy way just to break through and just win by fours. Like, you have to just play really slowly. Let the game just go on forever and ever. And then, like, on move on 150, finally they resign and you win. Okay, thankfully he's playing it a lot worse than usual, so I might actually win this a bit more quickly. But you get the idea, like, these kind of solves, it's like, you know 
they're complete and utter rubbish. And yet, you know, you play it and it just seems to take forever to win against it. Except in this case, it's like, maybe that's like the thing. Like, I remember there was this theory that I used to have, like, when I was, like, a lot younger, like, in, let's say, my early 20s, where I found, like, if I kind of said, like, something like, this is absolutely going to happen, it would kind of put a lot of pressure on me, and then it would often not happen, because I'd be thinking about the result instead of, you know, thinking about the, uh, you know, what I'm actually doing, like, focusing on the position. Uh, so now that I kind of was, like, reversing it, well, you can just, like, say kind of jokingly, like, the opposite, and then, like, well, then because you think, well, it's going to happen if, like, just whatever I say is the opposite is what will happen. That was, like, my logic at the time. But then later on, I got a bit wiser and realized that actually it's kind of not like that, that it's about... Well, kind of just basically focus is the key. Then, you know, what you focus on is where the energy is going to flow. And right now I'm focusing on playing as well as I can against this guy and punishing his mistakes. So F4, let's go for it. Against like a player of, let's say, over 1,600, I would probably never like go for this sort of thing. But against this player, like I figure he's probably going to let me take the pawn for free and I'll just be a lot better. We'll see if he finds knight h5. He's actually better after knight h5, but instead he blunders his pawn and I can still take this guy next move. You know, g5, h4. It's a pretty thematic king's gambit idea, but instead he just blunders the piece and blunders another piece. Okay, so how many pieces he blundered? He's blundered two pieces so far. I don't know if that, that probably shouldn't count as a pawn blunder, but okay, let's uh, just kick the queen. Is he going to blunder the queen now? Let's find out. I probably shouldn't be that harsh, like being... It's kind of funny, I literally said he's going to blunder Queen and he just does it on that move. Okay, uh, playing Sky a lot of times. I do want to try to get to, uh, what is it? I want to try and get to 200 points total, like on the league within the hour, uh, by the end of the hour. So let's, uh, let's try and do that. So F5, I'm going to do the same sort of thing. He might go E4 and try to stop like that, but maybe just Knight F6, keep the tension. And uh, yeah, let the position open up. It is true then in this case, like in this structure, this is a really not ideal. But he's playing like bishop h3, which is just a very ugly move at this point. You know, I hit this guy, hit this guy. It feels like I'm just doing very well here. Because if he plays knight g5, I've got like e3 and yeah, and say he just blunders the knight. That was easy enough. Okay, so so far so good. I think one win off, 200 points total. You know what? If he goes e5, let's play king's gamut direct. I don't need to prepare it. Let's just play, you know, the uh, big boy system. Uh, as I sound like say sardonically. Uh, anyway, so g5, yeah, I'll go for the quad system. There's a really cool trap that can happen if they go g4 and queen h4. We end up sacking a rook, but you get really strong compensation. But yeah, instead he's going this like h6 fisher kind of style. Let's go g3. I know this is meant to be a pretty stand idea in the king's gambit. That if they take you, open up that h file, the f file, you get really good pressure against this pawn, and they can have a lot of weaknesses on the king side, and you know, e knight is already a mistake. Because, yeah, the only square is g4, but now I think I go knight g5. And, I mean, I guess if you go knight e5, so maybe this is not as good as I first thought. But it's still pretty good. You know, hg5, I can take the pawn or... But then they might have some trick like bishop e5. I don't feel like it should work, but... Okay, so I just blunder a piece of d5 like a moron. And, unfortunately, he sees it. Well, can I go bishop b5 as gamble? He doesn't see c6. It's not a very good gamble, but what else can I do? I mean, normally I wouldn't trade the queen so I'm down a piece, but here I actually do get two pawns in a strong center. So I feel like it's a better swindling try and see I already paid off because I got a knight fork. And the thing is that because I made this moronic blunder before, he can actually yeah, play like bishop e5 and, you know, try to trap my knight. But actually this was a mistake on his part to do this. I thought he was going to go knight c6 and just win my knight that way. Because yeah, now I go rook d6 and, you know, things are cracking. I've got my knight coming back into the game and maybe I even have some forced checkmate, who knows. But uh, yeah, king c5 only move. Uh, how do we play this? Maybe just rook e1, just keep the pawn defended. I mean, he can still take, but yeah, he's going to lose anyway after that. So knight c7, hit the bishop. Bishop a2, I go b3 and trap it like that. You know, Bobby Fischer, Boris Spassky style. Well, take it with Spassky against Fischer in that game. Let's go uh, a3, prepare b4. And some mating net like rook e4, king c3, knight d5. Which I can actually still do here. Except he does at least have the option to... Oh, well, he also has the option to do that, which I didn't see. But okay, this is still winning. I go king b2 and erring is nice and consolidated here. And, well, the king just looks kind of funny on a6. Like, if you sort of came to the stream, like, you skip to this point. Like, how on earth did the king get to a6? Like, this is some magic trick. 
So Bishop F3, uh, let's play Rook E3, just pin it like that. Pinning and winning, as they like to say. All right, so he's giving up the exchange, probably a rage quit of some kind. Bishop E6, Rook E3, and yeah, he's got nothing here. But he's not going to resign for some reason. It's kind of weird when people say I'm resigning, like they might just resign when they're like down just one pawn and then the next game they're down a rook and they just don't resign because they're just stubborn. But okay, I'll just bring my king in. I can even, you know, sack, uh, sack the exchange at some moment to break through. It's pretty easy uh, to win it. But first let's get the king active because why not? So yeah, knight b7. It's kind of funny. It actually shows how dominated his knight is in this position because yeah, he can only go back anyway. So rook d3, rook d6, and something's got to give here. Um, actually, I'm just going to sack because I'm kind of lazy. Because, I mean, his knight is just... This actually is a really funny position. He only can move the knight, and man, this is quite amusing. So I guess that was one good thing about him not resigning, that at least in that case I get to, you know, show some beautiful chess geometry. Shows that chess does prove to be good for your academics. Okay, so I actually managed to win... Uh, What's the count? Yeah, I might get over 200 points in uh, less than an hour. I feel good about life. Yeah, d6 is very passive move. Like, you're just giving me a lot of tempi for free. It's like a Karakhan, but it's a much better version of Karakhan. Where I go in, like, knight f6 for free and the bishop looks ridiculous on b3. I meant to play e5, there was a mouse slip, but it kind of worked out, actually. Because after c4, yeah, I can... I'm going to go knight d4, like... I don't know if it's the best move, but I'm hoping he falls for a knight c2-4 because he's only rated like 1,200. Okay, he blunders a bishop. That works for me as well. Because I was thinking if knight e5, he would certainly play bishop b5, but I figured that, you know, in that version, he might not do it. Okay, this... I might go bishop c4, play a little differently. Uh, see what he does. Okay, let's go knight c3. If knight c6, I might go queen g4 just for fun, but he's developing the king side first, which... It's definitely a very solid way to play the opening to try to play it safe, but the problem is h6 is kind of a wasteful move. But yeah, actually d5 would be quite genius if he played it with castles instead of uh, instead of h6. But I think in this version it doesn't really work because queen h4 g3 just doesn't really have anything. Whereas in the castles version you could play like f5 or rook e8 and kind of rip open the the center rather quickly because queen h4 I can just defend very comfortably here with like g3 or bishop g3. Of course, now he doesn't have it anymore because I just blocked it. But, okay, h3. I quite like completely missed bishop b7, which is kind of sad. But, okay, it's still probably a winning position for white. And, yeah, he goes queen h4. And I guess I get a second double dip at uh, at the bishop takes b7. So, yeah, in this case, I was wondering for a second if I could trap his queen. But he always has a, a runaway this way or this way. But I get an extra rook, which is still pretty good. And, okay, let's just get the queens off because... Extra rook will be faster to convert, I think, if the queens are off the board. And, you know, he resigned, so it was a good decision to offer a queen swap. So, uh, I'm going to try playing some different things. Let's go Karakhan. Okay, d3 is actually a very good move in this position. I played this line a lot with white with really good results. But, yeah, just playing it as a king's Indian approach. So, yeah, not too special. It does mean that we're probably going to have a really long game uh, as a result. I mean, queen seven is not the most useful move for black, but I think my position is still pretty decent. I mean, he should probably go ed5, c4 if he wants to fight for an edge, but he's playing this sort of slow, boring stuff. So I'm just going to keep the tension a bit, just improve my position gradually, like d4, knight, c5. And I kind of get reward for my patience because he wanted to force the tension, but now he has a lot of weaknesses on the dark squares. The biggest weakness is d4. Ah, uh, now this just blunders a pawn. Um, okay, blunders a bit strong. He does have knight e5, but the arising position is very bad when he doesn't have his light squared bishop around the king. Uh, at the end of all of the captures, 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 which is actually what he does. I could actually grab a pawn with knight g3 if I want to, but like I said, I think it's better to not be up a pawn, but to have this bishop just really exploiting his weak king. Uh, I'm going to play rook e8. Uh, rook e8, yeah, bishop f4 I can take. It's fine. Queen h4, I might go queen... I was thinking queen d7, but knight c5 is kind of annoying. So I might just retreat the bishop with, to f5. Because I want to go bishop f6 and try to hit this rook with a tempo. If he moves this bishop away, I'll be able to take that pawn. So it means that his position is extremely bad at this point. And, well, I managed to win material. And in the case of rook d1, bishop c2, I actually pick up even more material because of the fork. That's why I decided to trade. But now it's got 
a very passive position and you know, bishop d3 kind of forces rook to a dodgy square because you know rook e1 i can take and rook d1 i go bishop c2 and i pick up at least uh well at least a piece as such i don't think you can even play it to you know, lose an exchange rook b1 i just go queen e5 and i'll just go bishop e5 here because trades are good for me when i'm up this much material so uh yeah let's play him again I know it's a little bit of repair playing the same guy over and over, but, you know, it means I get a lot more points, so I'm going to take the gift as it comes. Uh, so why is this happening? Okay, d5. Let's go c4. Let's mix it up a bit. Play it like Benko style, but with colors reversed. And, well, I get rewarded for it because he's blundered a free pawn. Yeah, queen a4. Um, maybe knight c4 directly was better, but I just felt like doing this for fun. And, of course, I do. It's my connection suddenly drops, which really, really sucks. Uh, but maybe it's fine now. Okay, I played bishop d7. We'll see if he spots the mate with, like, bishop e6. Okay, but I have queen b5. I still grab pawn. I was thinking at first I should have played knight d7 and grabbed the bishop pair, but the way it's turned out, I'm kind of happy with my decision. In fact, you know, knight d7, I go knight c6. Ah, FFS is connection, man. I think it's really weird. I know my connection is fine, but... Ah, knight 6, queen c8 is very tricky. Because then take, take, and he's threatening this back rank mate. So I'm going to play knight d7 instead. He'll take bishop takes, and... Well, I'm up two pawns, so it's still all well and good. And if queen takes, of course, I uh, I win this here. But instead he blunders this. But I can take, and you know, I'm hitting this. Ah, but he has rook c8. Okay, you didn't see it. This is this is a relief. Uh, but yeah, he's got rook c8 all the time in this stupid back rank garbage. Okay, so he doesn't realize that they're both under check, and... Okay, that was why I was a little bit nervous for one second, but I got the win. So, knight f3, uh, let's go knight f6. Let's play King's Indian style, actually. King's Indian to King's Indian, kind of funny. Doesn't mean it'll be a long game, though, so maybe this was not so smart to do, but... Oh, well, too late now. Uh, but I could have played, like, a Sicilian knight, at least. Play c5, knight c6, d6, rook b8, b5, etc, etc. And he's playing this very passively as well. Go a6, get in b5. I'm not going to pre-move it because, yeah, he might... Ah, I must have meant to play this. Oh, well, even with a tempo less, it's still good for me. Uh, so b4. And, yeah, if he takes, I just get this monster outpost. d3. And, yeah, I moved too fast because I could have won a pawn. Luckily for me, I still, you know, have this... I did something with a fret. I remember this used to happen to me so much when I was playing bullet, like... Uh, well, I think it was in 2005 or something, or 2006, when I started to play Bullet on in that chess club. But yeah, what would happen is like I would make this move, and I realize it was a blunder, and my opponent would play something really fast, showing that he uh, that he hadn't seen why it was a blunder yet. But then like he would make a move that made some threat that I had to deal with, and then when I dealt with the threat, then they could still play the trick. And then when I was thinking, well, how do I play in order to not fall for the threat that I should have stopped earlier? Then I don't see there's no way, so I just have to allow it. And in the time I'm thinking, they figure out a way. They're thinking, oh, I can just do this fret now. Uh, so it's like super frustrating. It used to happen to me. Thankfully, it doesn't really happen so much nowadays because, well, I'm a lot better at chess. I'm not rate 1800 like I was then, even if every now and then I play like it. But yeah, basically, that's uh, something. Uh, okay, Stafford Gambit. Actually, I have studied how to deal with this opening. I know you play like bishop to e2 after bishop c5. And then the kids just play c3, d4, and there's just nothing they can really do to deal with it. I think the trickiest line is like h5, knight, g4, this kind of rubbish. And yeah, it's going for it here, but now he just loses a piece with d4. Because I'm hitting this and I'm hitting this at the same time. So it just doesn't work for him anymore. And yeah, now I just take a free piece. And this is why you shouldn't play the Stafford Gambit against Grandmasters, for the most part. Because, well, even though it's not something that I face very often, I can certainly... In a classical game, your know, grandmaster would sit there and figure out how to how to refute it over the board. I have actually looked into it and seen, okay, this is how you refute it. So I do actually know this thing. And now you know it as well because I just showed it to you. So you are welcome. And yeah, this d4 is not so good when you're not taking back with a knight. Because now he's just losing time moving the queen everywhere. And I'm going to play knight f6 and just pressure this pawn. It's like knight c3, bishop b4. Frankly, I wouldn't be shocked if he played a move like bishop d3 or something at this point. Uh, which looks kind of stupid, but it might actually be one of the better moves in the position. Okay, so let's go e5. So let's go Taimanov style, queen c7, a6, b5, bishop e7, bishop b7. Okay, I'm allowing e5, but I do have d5, and I can mix it up like this. Although it's not actually that great, because I'm sacking a pawn, and... Okay, I do get good compensation for it, but 
Still, like, I could have just had a massive advantage with knight g4, and instead I got too, uh, too creative. I was going to play c3, and I hope he would blunder this, but I figured I'll show a little more respect to my opponent and just leave his knight out of play. Okay, b3. I am kind of tempted to sack it, actually. And probably it's not the best idea, but... Okay, I meant to play rook d8, but I mouse slipped. But it actually ends up being a good mouse slip, because now bishop c3, and I go, like, b4... Okay, and now he wants to play bishop take, so the idea is I take this way, and then I go b4, and that way his knight doesn't have anywhere to go, and if rook b4, I can even play knight d4 and fork the queen and the rook at the same time. You know what, I'll play knight d4 immediately anyway, which actually is incredibly stupid, because now queen e3. Oh, but actually no, no, it's smart, because if he takes, then I've got knight e2, and I win the queen. Okay, so I was unintentionally a genius, that's cool. Uh, actually, it's kind of like that's what like would happen. I remember like whenever I was playing like as a feed a master like when I was rated 2 300 to 2 400 Like there'll be times where I would play like this move and think oh, this was so bad And then later I realized like it was actually quite ingenious but it was like not intentional to play like that brilliantly Anyway, he's probably gonna play Stafford Gambit again. No, he goes knight c6. He learned his lesson So d4 play scotch game just because again, it's kind of a tricky move queen h4 But I guess I can show you how to deal with it so he's going to try and play queen e4 and try to win a pawn. I think this guy probably watched a lot of Eric Rosen videos. That's not a dig against Eric Rosen, but I know like he tends to recommend these sort of tricky systems where you know you get an early attack and if the opponent doesn't know what they're doing, you can get like a quick win or something. So I mean, it gets a lot of views, so credit to him. But yeah, this is like why you shouldn't play this because I just play very natural attacking moves, and I mean your queen is stuck in the center. I avoid the trade of queens. I mean, the attack just plays itself. Like, if you get this against a grandmaster, you're going to lose unless you're, like, the latest version of Stockfish. Then maybe you have a chance, but otherwise not really. The way six, I'll go c4. Now, rook e1 is actually very, very useful because he doesn't have queen e5 to hit the rook and to keep the attack on the knight. So it probably goes queen c5. Actually, queen h5 was probably a good move to trade the queens. I mean, I'd still feel like white would be doing well, but it definitely wouldn't be so clear. I guess queen tried to have bishop e2, but yeah, didn't have queen e5. Okay, I think it still would work out okay, but definitely it was better than what he did. Like, it's definitely a lot more unclear. Hmm. I'm going to play c5. The idea of c5 is that now he can't develop his bishop without opening up the position in front of his king, and for this reason, I think this is probably just losing for black, technically. Rook b1, I threatened this bishop b6. Ah, I just blundered the knight like a moron. Although, it might actually still work out for me if I play it correctly. But it's definitely not as clear as before. Uh, I mean, bishop e2 has queen c7, and bishop e6 just doesn't really do that much after king d7. Oh, but I have bishop f5 check. And it feels like I'm getting some sort of momentum. The question is, how do I follow up the attack after king c6? I mean, I feel like I should attack the queen somehow, so I'm just going to play rook e3. And, you know, he can give back some material, but... He's still going to come under a very big attack with rook b6 and, and all this. So he'll go queen c4 probably, but then I can at least get my piece back in the absolute worst case. And since I don't really see anything better yet, that's what I'm going to do. Just keep up my attack, get back some material, go threaten rook b6. And I mean, it's not easy for him to deal with because he also has to deal with rook c3. So he probably has to go knight d5 and defend that way. But I mean, then I can just play queen f3. Okay, so you're doing this, uh, well... It feels like I should just have something incredibly strong here. I mean, I can always play this rook b6 in the worst case, so let's do that. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's got this stupid fork here all the time. And he's hitting my bishop as well. Like, it's sort of annoying when they, like, play these, uh, these good moves. I can be very tricky and go rook d6 and rook d3, but I do feel like I deserve a lot more out of the position than this somehow. But, uh, I'm not sure if I have anything necessarily better at this point. So, on that basis, I'm just going to play... I forgot the move I intended. Rook d6, was it? Yeah, I'm just going to play rook d6 because I don't know what else to do at this point. And it does at least prove to be like a good looking tactic to get this. But if he plays rook c6, his position is probably quite good. If I mean, if he can at least stabilize the position. And I feel like with rook c6, he probably can do so. I mean, I can... Okay, but he blunders instead. He missed the fact I can just take it. And now it is just winning. I might even have force mate, actually. Like bishop b4, queen e5. And yeah, I get to zigzag. Okay, I didn't see he had king f6, but it's still, you know, his king is, his days are numbered, let's put it like this. You can play like f3, g4, and you know, the king is suddenly running out of air to breathe at this point. 
Um, so yeah, g4, I can pre-move queen e5 because that's the... Uh, king g5 is the only legal move for him. And I can pre-move queen h5 because king g6, queen h5. And queen f5 would still be mate. Okay, let's play him again. Wow, I'm actually like getting a lot more points than usual. So yeah, this good guy to play for the speed run. Let's go knight c6 again. We'll go for e5 and all this good stuff. I go h5 faster than usual just to panic him a little bit. Just, you know, go for the exchange sack, because why not? Now I get this fawn pawn a tree, which is pretty handy. Because the idea of the fawn play, it's not just that he's losing so much time moving the bishop back and forth, and obviously in see bishop f1 or he wouldn't have resigned, but... Okay, let's go h4 just as a kind of joke system. Like, what I'm doing is basically playing it so he can't go g6, say it well... If you don't know, you only play like this up every single game. So if you're forced to play something else, you're probably going to blunder something quickly. That's kind of logic. Of course, it's not something I would normally do. But, you know, let's have a little bit of fun here. We charge at H-Pawn. You know, Harry H-Pawn. Boom, boom, boom. And now I already have a weakness. So, yeah, you can already see, like, after playing so amount of time, like, when you beat them the same amount of time every time, it can get a little bit boring after a while. So there's a feeling you just want to mix it up a bit and stuff. So Knight G4... Actually, it's a better move than I first thought. But still, I can go, like, rook h3, you know, swing the rook over. I remember, actually, there was one time, like, I was uh, playing, like, some games for fun, some blitz game fun, and, like, playing, like, super creative systems every game. And, like, when I was, like, people, like, were watching, like, I was really enjoying the game because even though my moves were objectively not that good, they were linked to really fun positions. And that's kind of why I feel like h4, h5, h6 has kind of happened here. Like, basically, in this blitz game, I was just playing, like, h4, h5 in, like, almost every different kind of position. And this was actually before Alpha Zero kind of showed that this was actually a really good idea at a lot of points. So, yeah, I was ahead of my time. Uh, okay, I'm joking a little bit, but yeah, it's funny how uh, how chess changes. I'm going to go Rook G3 and yeah, try to play in that creative spirit I played in back then. You know, just go for very beautiful ways to attack the king. Kind of like the way Shakri Mamadrav likes to do it. He has this very creative style in his classical games even, where he just tries to, you know play somewhat originally and really fight for the initiative in every position and definitely it's a fun style to play if you're able to do it well. So uh, in any case, uh, so I'm actually happy to sack the pawn because then that opens up the f-file for an attack on the king. And now he just blunders a piece, that's quite handy. I'm going to take with check. Actually bishop g4 was better because then his bishop would still be on. Whereas here he can at least play knight e5 but okay, I mean now I'm just taking a million pieces for free which is always good news. Queen h6 now he's giving me more stuff. It's like Christmas in Hollywood. Okay, let's uh, play for over 300 points. Uh, let's go d5 move order. And I'm going to go knight c6. It's not as good because he can go d4 and sort of get a good trigger in. But in this version, you know, it's kind of uh, kind of all right for me. So I'm going to play bishop e6, queen e7, castle. Kind of like I recommend in my London uh, book, actually, that I'm writing. Just bishop h3, f5, h4. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's start with bishop h3. I mean, the idea of rookie one is normally that you can go bishop h1 and try to keep the bishop. But it just doesn't work that well here. Because I go h4 and he can't play knight takes. Because rook takes, queen g4 and he gets mated basically. That being said, I thought he might actually fall for it anyway. But, you know, he's smart and he doesn't. Okay, let's just build up the attack. Uh, yeah, let's just open up the position. I mean, I'm going to do it at some point anyway. And you know, bishop c5 check. Kind of shows why fg3, even though it keeps that file kind of closed, it's still, still kind of bad for white. Actually, this was a bit sloppy because he had d4 as a decent move on his part. At least gives him a little bit of central control. But his position still is pretty bad. I mean, his bishop and his rook are stuck. And, you know, I guess he might play knight e5, knight f3 and try to free it like this. But even then, like, he's still got this big weakness on, uh, well, I was going to say big weakness here. Yeah, now he gets made it. It's like, you know, when they play so quickly, like I try to explain something and already they blundered something before I get to explain the point. Seems to happen quite a lot in these streams, but anyway, let's continue with another game. If he's willing, if he's not willing, I'll play someone else. Uh, let's play a little differently. Let's play a system against him. Let's go just g3 and just see what he does. He goes g6, okay. I'm going to go knight c3. I have some really funny stuff if he goes c5. Is he just going to copy me? Like, this would be really funny if he copies me. But I'm going to play like the Nakamura setup. Except he's going to copy me. This... <laughs> This is funny. He's, he's copycatting me. Oh my god, this is like really good for the memes. So this is what I'm doing. Like, I'm going here so he takes. I can take. 
and he gets, he can't copy me anymore. He can't copy me anymore. And I, I troll this guy so good. Look, he's still trying to copy me. He's still trying to copy me, but it's, he can't copy me anymore. He doesn't have a pawn to, to get me with. Oh man, this is brilliant. Oh wow, this is good. Oh, now I, I take this. Oh, he's surely going to try to copy me like that. Oh man, this, this is too good. This is too good. Okay, knight c4. He's going to... Oh wait, actually this is kind of okay for him if he copies. Because he can now take this bloody pawn. Oh man, what have I done? This is a mess. Okay, but I can... Ah, he has d5. Oh wow, what's going on here? Uh, I mean, as one of my good friends say, Golly! You know, it's kind of like, you know, I guess his version of like, Crikey, mate! That they say like in Australia, like in the old Ocker days. It's kind of like when I sort of say the sort of Australian like sayings like, you know, like, how are you mate? And all that, like, I usually say like as a joke, like, I don't mean it. Seriously, like, this is not how modern Australians like actually talk. But it just like, it just sounds so funny to say at the time for some reason. Actually, I think I might have made some dumb blunder. No, actually it works. It works. I mean, I could have just said like, oh, it's all part of the plan. It was all planned. But yeah, that's the way it goes. For a second, I thought he actually resigned, but apparently not. Probably still figuring out what on earth is going on. Well, this is what's going on. I'm winning a piece. The queen c5, queen a4, and oh, look at those beautiful bishops. You gotta respect the bishops, guys. You gotta respect the bishops, and, and he respects them because he resigned here. Yeah. Well, that was a fun game. Um, yeah, copy this, punk. Copy this. So, knight c6. Let's just do the same thing. Why not? Let's see if he changes this up. I feel like at some point he's gonna be like, okay. What I'm doing is not working. I have to try something different. But I think he might play this like all the way until, you know, like midnight his time or whatever. Because in like the US, so it's probably what, I don't know, 10 p.m. or maybe like 9 p.m. where he is at the moment, right? And where in the US he is. Let's go Austrian attack with colors reversed. I mean, it's not a good idea because c4 and queen a4 and these tricks are good. But he's not been doing that in the last games and... Against these kind of passive subs like knight d2, e4 just works really, really well. Uh, so, what will he do? Maybe knight e1. I might put a bishop on c5 just to kind of have some pressure. And just h5, just rip open his king is my plan. h4 anyway, I don't care if you take. I'll take you. Tit for tat. Whatever you can do, I can do better. So, uh, okay. Uh, a tree. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take that one. Thank you. Oh, I can play... Can I go queen d7? I mean, you can go rook f5, but what a chance I'm seeing that. Well, chance of zero because he's getting mated instead. Uh, so, okay, let's take, let's take, we'll take stuff. Take, take, take. You know, it's like they say, like, with the Ekadamoto video, like the meme of captures, captures, captures. I really enjoyed it, by the way. It always kind of brought a smile to my face whenever I heard that. Oh, I have a free queen. I literally, like, didn't see the free queen for a couple of seconds because I was busy trying to remember, like, the Ekadamoto story. But anyway... Uh, yeah, so we've got this, and, uh, well, he decides to play on till mate. Well, at least we won, I won quickly. Let's get another one. <clears throat> Knight f3. Dude's gonna copy me again. Let's play something where if he copies me, it's just as bad, like d4. Then if d5, I play cd5, and, yeah, try to keep copying me now. Ah, oh, but the thing is, he actually can kind of do it, in fact. Okay, at least he can't after knight c3, but the problem is now the queens get traded, and it means this game is gonna go on for a freaking eternity. So, uh, yeah. Well, at least we're going to enjoy a nice endgame masterclass. Ugh. I mean, it's always like, you know, when you see the movies, like when the, like the bad guy, like, cracks their neck like that. And, you know, they just looks really cool. Like, they sort of crack their knuckles, but they do it, like, in a really badass sort of way. I've always been wanting, like, trying to learn how to do it, like, consistently. But, yeah, I haven't got to it. Remember that time, like, I used to have, like, this nervous tick where I just, like, crack my, like, knuckles, like, every half an hour to an hour. Just because, like, to release the tension. It's kind of funny because like in chess, you know, you normally don't want to release the tension without a good reason because if like, let's say you're the first to exchange, often it'll just help the opponent get to piece to a better square of their capture. Of course, there are a lot of exceptions to this principle, but it's something that can be useful to for outplaying these guys or even the guys a lot higher rate than this one. It's not a free 96. Let's push E5 again. I guess imagine like there's going to be a bunch of people after this video going to say, oh, I play 96 because Max was playing in a bunch of games as 1200. Like, knight is not a very good move, because d4 on your knight just looks very stupid on this square. But I'm playing this because of the fact that he never plays d4, and I'm just, like, you know, messing around with h5, h4. So, uh, I mean, yeah, these sort of 
like stream like I'm mainly watching it like just to try playing to win as quickly as possible. I'm not trying to play as well as possible. It's like something I do as I say, not as I do uh, as such. So let's see. You might just play H4 at some point to say like I'm just sick of you like pushing his H pawn. I'm just going to stop it. And yeah, actually he does. But now he gives me knight g4, bishop c5, and boom, we got some pressure here. It's so knight g4, let's just go for a hack attack. Bishop c5. I want to go f6, g5 at some point. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Queen e1, very passive move here. Yeah, I want to go e4, but I'm just going to play bishop e6. And it's not the point, like, if I took here, his knight gets better with, get on a better square, they're a capture. But now if he takes me, my bishop gets to a better square. So that's kind of the idea of why I'm keeping the tension. And also means they're more likely to blunder material like this if they have enough rope to hang themselves as such. So, uh, yeah, I think I missed knight c2, which is winning a material, but okay, this is fine. I am still got this as a threat. I'm wondering if he will see it and play queen d1 or if he will remain completely oblivious. The answer is he remains completely, remains completely oblivious. See, like, his moves, like, so crazy and really forgetting how to talk. And now there are a million pieces on pre, which is kind of funny. Uh, let's take it... Let's take it this way, just so a bunch of pieces get traded. Because I'll make it a bit faster to win. Like, rookie 1, king d7. And I'm just up uh, full piece, and I am taking pawns. Well, life is good when you are just taking more pawns. But sure, if he was stupid, I should just go rook f8. I go, it's kind of assuming that he would just, like, uh, take without thinking, and then I would just be up a piece. But now he's got, like, a little more counterplay than he deserves here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, like, sack the pawns, basically. Yeah, rook c7. Okay, this... Okay, actually, this is kind of clever, because you got rook e4. Yeah, really, like, technique is absolutely terrible this game. But fortunately, I'm still winning with correct play. And he just blunders a bishop with to the pin. So that's easy enough. I'm expecting him to resign, and he does. Alright, how many times am I going to play this guy? Wow, I played him 26 times. I actually did not realize how much I was playing. I must play this guy for, like, an hour already. But I'm doing it because I want to, like, just boost my score up. And, uh, yeah, just get get a lot of points really quickly. I mean, if I play him, like, for three hours, I have a feeling that I would probably get, like, almost on the leaderboard with this, but at the same time, if I do that, it's probably going to be, like, a really sort of boring kind of video if I just play him, like, the whole time. So I think I'm going to make this the last game against him and move on to another victim. Okay, be blunt as a knight. Thank you very much. You should probably go h6 and then go for something, but, yeah, now I just do this, and, yeah, got some little discoveries here. Okay, let's just take the pawn, because I don't know what else to do. Knight d4. Okay, queen f6. Yeah, he really wants to try to attack me, but he's just not got the material for it. Okay, let's find a new opponent. I've played this guy enough times already. 27 times. So, okay, let's see who is next up. Okay, 1600 rated player. Uh, let's go e5. Let's uh, play it aggressive. Okay, knight f3. Try and play reverse Nimsvich Sicilian. I'm going to play knight c6 and take back with the pawn, or in this case I can take and just play like knight f6, d5, and that'll give me a pretty good position. I mean, white is okay, but black is certainly at least equal. Just going to keep the tension in the center, rather than trying to grab a pawn. Although I could actually take it if I wanted to. That might actually be the best move, just grab the pawn. Uh, of course, I blundered d4, bishop, queen d4, bishop b3, I was getting the pawn back, which was kind of careless of me. But now in this version, I mean, now black is definitely better. So bishop f5, just consolidate the pawn, threaten a one-move checkmate. We kind of force him to go g3, which is actually a kind of big concession in this case. But he doesn't see it, and I get a really quick win. Let's see if he's up for another game. Wow, zero mistakes, zero blunders. I actually thought I played very badly that game, and then I end up, like I uh, said, I played really well. For a little variety, I'm going to play the Tromposki against him, just to, you know, mix it up a little bit. Also, I'm kind of curious to see what I will do against these sort of things. I'm kind of tempted to go h4, even though it's not objectively a very good move, but it's kind of like an Alec and Chitard attack with colors, with like, uh, instead of black having a pawn on d5, they have a knight on d5, which should be a much better version for white. Probably knight f3 has been imprecise, because now I don't have queen g4, but maybe I go queen d2 and just keep harassing anyway. Like, it's have a lot of space, a big lead in development, and even ideas maybe to mess up their structure at some point. No, for the moment, I think I'm just going to keep the tension. Okay, he blunders a pawn. That was uh, very kind of him. Thank you for the generous donation to, well, to this game at least, to my position. So, uh, yeah, what else have we got? Uh, so, I take the free queen. That's what we got. And he probably resigns. Okay, another really quick win. Like, one I like less than one minute. Talking way too fast. Oh, not too way too fast, but I'm talking way too much. 
So I'm going to take a little bit of a breather and uh, yeah, focus on the position. G3, let's open it up. Take, take. So it's an open Sicilian, but it's with colors reversed. And normally they used to play bishop to knight to b6, but then this bishop c5 sort of became trendy in the last couple of years. Like I wrote a opening survey, I think back in like 2017 or sometime around then, when this line was only starting to be played by good players. Uh, okay, so now I've got queen e7, e4, and just kill his knight. That's my thinking. I'm giving him knight d4 though, but I could... Why do I want to play it? I might just go bishop g4 so I can play f5 out shutting in the uh, the bishop. And I don't really mind about the doubled pawns because my position is so active that it really doesn't matter that much. If the doubled pawn's on a half open file, like say this pawn wasn't here, then yeah, that could be a problem. But in this version, I think it's really not. I mean, my rook comes here and well, what's the follow up after rook d1? Maybe queen g5, try to threaten some cheap queen takes g3 using the pin. Okay, the fact he played rook d8 just me might not have seen this yet. Okay, now he sees it, but I'm so tempted to take, but I don't think it's best. I'm just going to dominate down the d-file and just play a more positional kind of game. Yeah, bishop c3 had this trick, but he decides not to allow it. Rook queen d8, and now it's an interesting question how to follow up bishop c3. But okay, instead he goes for this. He has queen c3, and I might have to go bishop f8 and just make sure my pawn is safe and I'm not getting mated to the battery. I mean, one thing's for sure, he's playing this better than he was in the uh, in the previous two games, because, I mean, he's still alive at this moment. Though he is down a pawn, and I do think that with his pieces being so passive, it should technically be winning. I mean, if he was able to kind of challenge the file, it would be a bit of a different story, but here it's not so easy. So Bishop G2, I think, is a good move on his part, uh, trying to get this in. I'm going to go... Yeah, I'm going to play a5, because I want to try to go for some bishop b4. But this I'm not so sure about on his part, because now my queen invades, and I don't know if he can really do a lot about that. But I'm also wondering like, how to actually break through here. I'll play, start with queen e2, see what he does in reply. And after this, he has king g1, and I don't actually have a mate on him. Okay, let's just take with the queen then. And uh, queen d1, and maybe just play like queen d3. Just try to get the queens off the board. He has queen e5 though. I probably have to go back to d7. Yeah, or I can just take the pawn that way. And uh, okay, I'm still up a pawn at least. But I do feel like it's a position that if white plays perfectly, he might be able to save it. But I think that in this case, I'm pretty certain that uh, I'll just keep the pressure up. And at some point, he'll make mistakes. Like putting a bishop here is not great, I think. Because it sort of frees my bishop, for example. Uh, I mean, I could even just you know play moves like... Uh, I guess bishop e7, g5, and just kind of improve my position steadily. So okay, he goes back. I'll play bishop e7 after all. And well, just try to improve things a little bit. He doesn't have queen h8 because of this. So okay, let's go h6, just slowly improve things. I have to be a little bit careful because queen d 5 might have some bishop g7 tactics or something, overloading the king. Yeah, h4 is a good move on his part. Yeah, g6 is probably not the best because he has queen d8, queen h8. And he gets very annoying counterplay all of a sudden. To a point where I might have to play something like bishop to f6 and just go into a queen inning that basically is going to be a draw if the queen just come off. But this is actually, I think, a big mistake now. Because now we can't really avoid the trade of queens when this bishop is under fire. And I'm pretty sure that bishop ending is winning when he's got all his pawns on the same color as the bishop. But you'll notice that my pawns are nearly all in this opposite color to my bishop, which just makes my bishop a million times better than his simply. And my plan is going to be to get my king as active as possible. And yeah, if you're going to blunder bishop like that, it's just going to be easy. So, okay, I thought he might rage quit and just put all his pawns on pre, but he wants to lose the slow and painful way instead. The king e2, just run him out of moves, h4, and just crash through like this. And eventually he'll end up in a zugzwang like this. Oh, he might play f4. I just have to make sure I don't stalemate by some fluke. But okay, he resigned instead. Now let's find a new opponent. Play a game kind of badly, but I managed to win in the end. So e4. Ah, oh, you're boarded. That's kind of funny. Not sure why after rematch when you just boarded, but anyway. Let's see who's up next. How are we doing for time? I think we're at what? Yeah, we're at one and a half hours, like halfway point. My plan is like to make this a roughly three hour stream. Like I think any longer and my voice would kind of give out, but I think this is a, a decent number. I played this guy before, like I recognize the Egyptian flag. He plays like normally Slav kind of stuff. Okay, this time he decided to play g6. Alright then, we'll get a normal position. I can go h4 a little more quickly than usual. 
because I didn't play Knight C3 yet. And maybe I can even... I'm kind of thinking of playing something like C4. Maybe on the next move I'll do it. I'll play C4 and kind of argue that maybe H5 is sort of an improved version of a, uh, a normal Grunfeld. But yeah, this line's not great on his part. He's trying to grab the pawn, but I've got 96 all the time. So in this case, maybe I should just take it and go Queen B3 and just have a strong initiative. Kind of a lot like we see with the lines I show in my London book. And yeah, you can see he blundered a pawn out of the opening. Yeah, to put the queen on d7 instead. I'll go bishop, uh, I was going to say d3, but I'll put it on e2, because I can always play queen b3 to cover it. Uh, so, okay, knight b4, I just go queen b3, and he kind of has nothing. His best plan would be to go rook d8 and try to get e5. That's the best way for him to free his position. So I'm going to put my queen on e4, just a nice central square that, you know, discourages e5, because now I'm covering it with the queen. To be fair, he does have rook e8, and he still probably gets it back, but not like this, because now he just blunders the, blunders the house. You know, if f6, I can even play like queen g6, and I think he's just getting mated here. I don't know, I can play f e5, bishop d3, queen h7. He doesn't really have a defense to this. Okay, queen e6 is probably best try, but now I go here, and, you know, this is the worst case, where I'm just picking up uh, a ton of material. It's so funny, like, when I'm doing like this, like, my natural inclination is, like, just to swear, like, I've maybe... It's not like, the amount, like, I swear, like, in the four play just like, you think I listen to Gary Vaynerchuk all the time, but, uh, no, it's not the case. Uh, I picked it up from Eminem, if anybody. Anyway, okay, so now I just tr sack back the exchange to get an easily winning pawn ending. Yeah, this is why I remember this guy. This is a guy who just never resigns. He just plays on to mate, even if you're up a million pawns. Okay, maybe I'm thinking of someone else, actually, because he did actually resign there. And because he resigned, I'm giving him a rematch. So I play knight f6, maybe do some Portuguese stuff. Yeah. You know, I actually, I think like with the Portuguese, like I automatically think of Nando's when I think of Portuguese, which, you know, it's probably like shows, you know, how westernized like the Australian culture is. But yeah, sort of a thing. Like I still remember that lovely peri peri sort of chicken and like it was just so delicious and so tasty, like just really, really special. And like I thought I had like some special memories of it because I remember like I had this, uh, this student, I, like, I used to coach, like, whenever he had a tournament, I would help him prepare for it. And he really liked eating Nando's. So we kind of eat Nando's, like, while between, uh, like, later in the break of our sessions. And then because of that, like, I remember, like, so around the time I was coaching, I also had a, you know, had a girlfriend at that time. And, like, potentially we were also, like, eating at Nando's as well. Kind of funny how this sort of works, reflecting back. But anyway, that's, uh, yeah, that's a story, like, of my con closest connection probably with Portugal. Uh, which is see not that close. But anyway, now my opponent just blundered the knight. Earlier the queen was actually covering it, but not anymore. And you're now going knight g4, queen h2, mate. Or he just resigns. Again, that was a pretty quick win. Let's see if we can beat him quickly another time. He doesn't want to play. That's fine. Find a new guy. I already lost kind of how many points I like. I saw it on the screen a second ago and I like just didn't process it. Because I was still thinking about that Nando's chicken. Actually, now my favorite chicken is like the special like fried chicken recipe of... Uh, of my mother-in-law. That's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah. Actually, now like they sort of steam the chicken more because I meant to be like on a diet losing weight. But yeah, that's, uh, that's where things are at. I'm just going to play mainline. Okay, f5 is not very good. I mean, I'm just going to develop normally and probably just play like bishop d3, rook g1, g4. I mean, bishop d3 might even be kind of superfluous. Maybe I just go g4 immediately for the heck of it. Okay, now I'm going to actually take and, uh, play g4. It's probably not the best way to play, because I'm giving him 94, but okay, just trying to tie up the board and draw that way. But it's not going to really work. So bishop e2. Now that being said, I haven't really played this in the best way. His position is sort of not as bad as it was, at least. So okay, I'll take. Um, I'll just go into... A... I can play f4. I completely forgot about this. But okay, if I can get in g5, that will at least completely trap in his bishop. So he plays bishop e7 to avoid that. But okay, c4. I'm going to open up his uh, his king side like this. i open up the center, I should say. And you know, g5, I've got f5. Um, I play rook c1, just keep the tension, because it's really good if he takes me, because now I get a lot of pressure on this guy. And if bishop e6, I might play king to h1, because my idea is I want to go f5. Okay, so this is his idea, which is actually kind of smart. He wants to go for d4. And I can't really avoid that, so I'm just going to sack the exchange to keep control over the position. Because it's important I don't let his pawns kind of get out of hand here. So I'm going to go f5, e6. And I think my majority is definitely a lot better than his. Let's put it that way. So f5, we keep on attacking. 
And uh, bishop a6, I think, was his idea of a5. He wants to make sure the rook is defending it. But at the same time, I do have a pretty strong attack on his king. I think g5 is really the best move here, because well, I can even play rook d1 and just switch back to attacking his weakness. Bishop b7, e6, and already I'm threatening e7. And if I'm able to get something like bishop d4 and the queen on this diagonal, it's just going to be complete murder as such. And in fact, I can already kind of do it with queen c7, e5, if he doesn't play queen d8 here. But if he does play queen d8, go e7, so he's kind of just lost anyway. You know, queen h6, queen c7. It's okay, he plays it like this. And I'm wondering if I should even actually take the exchange with queen c8, if it's even better just to play queen d6 and just mate him on the uh, on the dark squares. Uh, so yeah, this is like why you don't really want to put the bishop and the pawns like this, because yeah, you just get a very bad position in that case. If you're just very passive. It's like the bishop, yeah, it's a good defender, but that's the best you can really say about it. It's not exactly helping defend your king, right? Okay, so queen e5 and... Indrin says, checkmate in 6. Actually, it's not true, because black has rook f6, and he can give up the rook to avoid mate. But that's not really going to be the way to save the game either. Okay, and now he's, I don't know, having a his coffee or sipping his tea uh, or something and then plays rook f6 okay take he could go d4 but it doesn't really do that much actually do have to be slightly carefully doesn't get some sort of wacky counterplay maybe let's go bishop yeah i'll play bishop b5 and a4 and just defend that way but yeah e3 i'll go king to g1 d4 i can take uh, with the bishop e2 i just play this and i just get the pawn anyway so that's fine Takes. He can go bishop f3, but I have h3, and, and that keeps control of the position. In fact, I can even go e7. Yeah, let's go e7 and just queen our pawn. That's even better. And I actually had force mate, but he resigned. Oh, 405 points. Yeah, doing pretty well. 405 points in like one and a half hours. That's definitely much faster than my usual rate of getting points with this league. So, uh, yeah, there's some hope that I might get like 800 points by the end of this, uh, by the end of this little stream. And actually, I don't have to put that. Like, it won't put me on the leaderboard because I think, like, number one is, like, when I changed it, it was something like 1,300, and it's probably up to, like, 1,600 or more by now. But at least get me, like, when striking, just, like, if I do a second part, like, three hours will probably put me, like, near the top of the leaderboard. But it's taking me a bit of time to actually find an opponent. So, uh, okay. Uh, is there any other chess news I can think of? Uh, well, I mean, I can't really think of that much chess news, but it's kind of doesn't matter because I've got the new opponent. It's not like it's not like Adriano Miranda because actually I remember like one of my childhood friends in chess, like his name was Adrian Miranda, like this Indian junior, like very, uh, very smart guy. And uh, yeah, I was like kind of also quite like a bookie, bookish player, like sort of knew his openings quite well for his, uh, for his level like me at that time. So uh, yes, I definitely got along very well with him. And actually, I haven't kept in touch with him for a while. Like definitely when I eventually, you know, go back to, uh, to Australia, and then probably like one of the top like five or ten people definitely want to like meet up with in person, you know, once the lockdowns are all sorted and everything. So uh, anyway, I get to take a lot of trips down memory lane in this uh, in this stream. So anyway, uh, let's see, I can go, yeah, I'll go C4. I actually do cover this in my book, I was just recollecting the idea. The reason playing A3 is like really, really subtle, and it's probably not going to come up in this game, but there's a point that like if they play knight e4 and g5 you kind of benefit a lot of having the bishop being able to retreat to h2 but of course he just plays his queen e7 move that doesn't really do anything it kind of just allows me to get the bishop pair basically for free with a3 but actually this kind of shows the idea i want to show anyway like knight e4 rook c1 if he was able to play g5 and f5 and f4 that would actually be pretty decent for black or like g5 h5 i think that castles just looks very suicidal quite frankly because I think the attack kind of just plays itself here. Uh, with, you know, queen a4, b5, and just pile of pressure on these guys. Uh, so a6, I mean, I might just even play b5 directly. Because he can't really take it, actually, on b5. But if this, yeah, I mean, I can go... Ah, c5, knight e5 is kind of tricky. But I can take here first. Go queen a4, and I mean, his king is just way too weak at this point. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, the story. For those of you who actually have watched this from the start and are still here, you know, I guess I... Or to congratulate you because, well, I know from my own experience that you know, my attention span is not always super long with videos. So if you stuck out for all the way to this point, congratulations. And well, uh, let's uh, continue this fun journey. And if you uh, if you just got here, then yeah, welcome to you guys as well. So C6, uh, yeah, now I think I do want to take. I want to take because I have 
Rook takes c6, and I sack the exchange by just crash through and leave his king horribly weak. I'm guessing rook d7 might be a mouse slip because... Well, I mean, I can even play like rook uh, here if I want to. I think I might just be forcing mate almost. Well, as he plays rook c7, but now he is losing a truckload of material. Like, it reminds me like the old, uh, you know, ads I used to see uh, when I was... Uh, when I was a kid, like, they had these, like, lotto ads, you know, for the lottery. Uh, where they would, like, have this saying... Which I've already kind of forgotten as I was talking. So, uh, yeah. Probably a good thing because yeah, I don't really exactly want to encourage people to go into something and have like, what, a 1 to 30 million shot of winning the prize. Like, the top prize or something. And then it's like with lottery wins. Like, even if you win the prize, like, nearly all the people who win the prize are like, going back to their, uh, to, like, how much they were worth at the start. You know? Like, they go back to what they were comfortable with or it makes them, like, just go completely bankrupt. So, even the ones that win, they end up kind of, like, losing out in the end. Which is kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, so, well, as I was talking about lotteries, well, the lottery here is like, is my opponent going to resign now or is he going to flag in one minute later? That's just a matter of roll of the dice. Okay, actually resigned. Okay, let's, uh, okay, since you resigned, I'll play you again. I only made two mistakes, which, considering I wasn't paying any attention whatsoever to the game, probably not too bad. Let's play Scandinavian, but I'm going to play Queen D5 this time just for a little variety. But, I mean, the solid way to play is this knight f6, like, bishop f5, c6, and this sort of thing. But I think against this guy, I might play a little different with knight c6 and go bishop g4 castles. It's complete rubbish, because if I play bishop d2 or even, yeah, bishop d2, it's just completely bad. But in this version, it's kind of, I think, quite decent. If you play, like, bishop c4 already, it sort of makes more sense. Uh, you know, I can castle e5, and his d4 pawn really comes out of fire. It's only like if you're playing someone, let's say, below like 2 300 or so, then you could even just win very, very quickly. And well, now I can even play like queen takes g5, which is not necessary, but it's kind of a nice tactic to see that you can force the trade of queens and just be a piece up for nothing in the arising position. Granted, e6 is perhaps more precise. But I want to pressure d4 more quickly and sort of stay true to the original plan. If d5, well, you're knight b4 and you've got some nice fork, and okay, here I just get to take more material. So rook d1 just e5, and actually it kind of reminds me of a line I was looking at in the semi-tarash uh, quite recently, but except the difference is here, I'm a piece up. So rook d1, e5, bishop e3, I probably take the free pawn on c2 at that point. Okay, in this case I take the free knight, thanks. And uh, e5, he does have c3 to at least get the piece back, but he's still, no he doesn't get the piece back, because I have knight e6 and I hit his bishop. That's kind of sneaky. Okay, let's take, let's take. Just take all the free pawns. It's Christmas. Here, yeah, rook c7, knight e3. Let's go for a whole bunch of captures. Rook g7, knight f5. And I have a discovered attack on your rook, sir. Thank you very much. And around this point, I expect my opponent to resign. Okay. I could actually send a rematch. We'll see if I play the same guy or a different guy. Okay, same guy. Let's go d4. I want to see what he does against the London, just out of curiosity. Okay, he goes England Gambit. That's funny. Actually, I decided not to cover the England Gambit. I book it. This is such a rubbish opening. It really doesn't deserve coverage. Like, I don't want to give it the respect of, like, having any treatment. So, I guess you get to see how to refute in this video. You know, just go Knight C3, Knight B4, Knight D4, defense this here. And if Bishop B4, just go Rook B1. I don't think it's going to go for like the chess bra, queen takes c3 sack, which is objectively losing, but at least it's kind of a, well, an attempt to unbalance the game a bit. But yeah, now after like knight d5, this is just completely lost for black. The point being that, you know, you're threatening the knight c7 fork, and, well, if they play king d8, you can just play like e4, and, okay, and so he just blunders the, the rook this way. Maybe it's only in a blunder in exchange, perhaps, because he can at least try to, well, he could have tried to go king d8 and try to trap it, but... Yeah, I mean, now he now he's down a rook for nothing, and, and my knight gets out, which is pretty good. In fact, I could be very sneaky and play, like, knight e5, king d6, knight f7. That would be really funny, like, to fork both the rooks in one game, but... Okay, so he gives me three pieces this way. King e6, yeah, knight f4, let's do it with a check. He might go king f5, I like, think this is king of the hill or something crazy. Because in king of the hill, if you get the king to one of these four squares, you win the game. That's sort of the, the reference to the joke. But okay, e3, bishop b5, castle, you know. The position plays itself. I can almost pre-move every move and win here. 
It's not completely true, but it's pretty close to true. Uh, so, okay. Pre-move this. Pre-move that. Pre-move this. And I think it's starting to rain outside. I can just imagine, like, if... Because I remember I was, like, watching a, a stream. Like, this guy I had two viewers on a stream. And, you know, I wanted to you know, kind of support him and, like, be there to listen. He's, like, quite a, a good four-player chess player. But, uh, yeah, the thing is, like, he had this sort of echo, I think, with... Uh, his voice he couldn't really solve and so no one really wanted to watch. Kind of felt bad for him to be honest. But anyway, though with the rain it's kind of like I sort of have this own version of this. Of course as a possible you can't hear the rain whatsoever and only I can hear it but okay at least you know it's raining that the uh was the thing that my uh my parents used to say that at least the uh <clears throat> you know, at least the farmers uh getting you know, their their crops watered as it were uh, as a result. Anyway so we have this yeah, those are kind of like, I know I'm living in, uh, in Rakya in Vietnam and it's like, uh, basically like a fishing sort of town. Like they have really, really good seafood here. Uh, you know, obviously being like by the sea. So, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good life. And yeah, if you, you know, find a lovely Vietnamese wife like me, then yeah, of course, even better. Uh, so anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about chess a bit more. So Rook D8. Okay. His Rook's on the open file. He knows... His, uh, his end game principles. Unfortunately, end game principles don't help you that much when you're rook down for nothing. So we have this. Um, I might play c3, bishop d3. You know, any move as such. You know, it'd actually be kind of funny if I played it like Fog of War chess, where I just didn't know where my opponent's pieces were the whole game. Uh, as such, and I still try to win a rook up. I mean, you've got to find a chess.com program where you could kind of play, like, not just blindfold, where you actually didn't know what moves your opponent played. It would be kind of funny if you could do that where they, they know and you don't as a sort of way to give odds. But anyway, so F5 at least is trying to be tricky, but I'm actually going to let him do it. Like here, it's where he thinks he got me, but I actually got him because he loses the rook. It's kind of a, a funny point. I remember Mikhail Tal used to as well. He'd set some trap where you'd think that you were catching him in the trap, but actually he was the one catching you in the counter trap. It's kind of fun when that happened. Let's go Alikin. I haven't played Alikin yet in this stream, so let's do it. Well, I think, like, if you want to actually say, Alekin, I'm not going to say it over and over, I'm going to lose my voice, but yeah, this is, uh, one good thing about the Alekin is that you are threatening to take a pawn, and if they are beginners and don't see it, you win a free pawn. Actually, to be fair, there have been bullet games I play where I pre move like, two knight f3, and so I found myself losing a pawn, so I shouldn't be too judgmental. So, if bishop d3, I was going to take, take e6, and, well, then I basically have, like, kind of a, well, a sort of Slav defense with, uh, extra pawn for free, in a sense. So let's see what he does. If he plays 94, you can sort of see... There's a really good strategy in Blitz to play moves where if they exchange your pieces, you just get a much better position as a result. So Bishop G4 kind of preps that, because I've got the pin on the knight to work with in that case. So, what else have we got here? Man, I almost feel like falling asleep. I mean, imagine now, like, I'm recording a live video and I fall asleep on the stream. I mean, that would be an absolute meme. The problem is, like, if you fake it, then when, like, you... Do, if like, it happens for real, they'd be like, oh yeah, you're just faking it. And no, I actually did fall asleep. Kind of funny if that happened. Anyway, I digress. So, okay, I'm going to take this here. Play 97 and just, you know, swap everything. You know, swapsies. And I know it's not like, you know, those reality TV shows where I have, you know, the kind of married at first sight or whatever it's called in the str uh, You know, where like they have the... They're like, oh, there's this couple and they're like really unhappy and they do this some sort of random swap to try to improve the relationship. It was a good thing I didn't premium 97 because obviously you might have trolled me like queen h5, 97, queen f7, mate. Because then you've got to be a little bit careful about these sort of pre-moves. Because that would be a sort of trick like in a 15 second game could be kind of annoying. But okay, bishop b4. Guys, because they're in 94, but I didn't want to allow queen c7 with a check. So okay, where is this queen going? Whew. Okay, so let's uh, consider the possibilities. If queen b3, I might actually be able to play knight d4 anyway if I want to. With the idea of queen b4, knight c2 would be kind of a nice fork. I mean, it's true, it's probably not the best way to play, but it would still be technically winning. I mean, I'm up a piece, so kind of everything is winning here, right? But he's thinking for a long time, like he's already putting me to sleep. Maybe this is his strategy, hoping I fall asleep, then he makes a move and suddenly flags me. Uh, so okay, let's attack his queen once again with a tempo. He realized to go after his pawn for some reason. F4 takes, threaten the fork. 
And as I expect, he doesn't see the fork. And I win the queen. <sighs> yeah, let's play it again. The thing is, like, uh, well, he did spend so much time on his moves. I think that'll just be the last game I play against him. I was kind of playing just out of habit, but he's playing a bit too slowly for my liking. So I think, yeah, this will be the last one. It'd be kind of funny if someone were, like, e5 against me one day, like, thinking I'd pre-move bishop f4 and try to win a free piece. That would be a very dirty trick, but probably it's going to happen to me at some point uh, from all these games I play. Though it's kind of more likely in, like, Hyper Bullet than in, uh, in these games, to be quite frank. So, yeah, Bishop, I used to play C4 all the time in games. I gave him Dinner Tank in some of my games, like, in the league before, but... Yeah, but Bishop B5, it's a lot better, because now I have Knight E5. Like, E6 is not really the best move, because basically, if Queen D6, I just go Knight C6, and I'm just carrying attack. But now, if Bishop D6, I just win the exchange completely for free. And I even pick up a pawn as well, and okay, I even pick up a queen. So, I mean, he should just resign here, but I guess, yeah, he does think that GM stands for genetically modified or something, and think, oh, he's genetically modified, so he's going to drop dead from some sort of cancerous disease or whatever. Okay, I'm joking a little bit, but you get the idea. You can resign. Thank you, sir. I think, yeah, he's from uh, from Brazil. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, for some reason, I kind of feel like talking about, uh, about some things I probably shouldn't talk about. So, I'm going to bite my tongue and not uh, and not talk about it. It would be like, uh, like bad taste. So, anyway, going back to chess... I'm sorry to play like rook c1 just to troll. I mean, yeah, and he pre-moved like uh, to take the bishop and now I win a piece. Like, there is if he took my queen, I was going to take and have back rank made ideas. Obviously completely unnecessary. Actually, I am going to find someone else to play. Thank you for the game, sir. Let's find a new opponent. It'd be kind of funny, like, sometimes I do the seek and I end up getting the same guy anyway, which is sort of amusing. But anyway, let's, uh, let's see what we got. And what we got is a new subscriber. Actually, I don't know if I got a new subscriber from this video. I'm just guessing that uh, as such. Because if I don't have a new subscriber like from this video after two hours, well, that would be, let's say, not the world's greatest return on investment. So, yep. Another good reason to, to get that sub in, guys. Sub, sub, sub. Let's do a sub train. I think that's what I called on Twitch. Kind of sounds better on Twitch, actually. I have people like going, sub train! Woo! Okay, let's, uh, let's see what we have here. So, okay, this setup actually is quite good for white if he plays, like, d4, bishop, e3, c4. Actually, h3 is also a very good move, and, yeah, against, like, a decent rate player, I wouldn't play queen h5, but it's only going to be a little bit tricky in blitz where you go, like, take, take, and, you know, you lose the piece, and objectively it's nothing, but you kind of get, like, e5, e4, and you can try to mate on h2. I kind of sort of realized this idea after seeing, like, Carlson beat Bill Gates in, a, in this line with... Uh, like, I had this sort of casual game where Carlson had one minute and Bill Gates had, like, ten minutes or something. And Carlson checkmate in nine moves. Actually, I believe I have a video of that on my YouTube channel, actually. I might link it in the, in this, uh, uh you know, a suggested video here if I, uh, if I remember it. If I can't find, like, the section next few minutes, then, yeah, you can, uh, just search yourself, I suppose. But anyway, going back to the actual chest, yeah, now I get the same attack area like Bishop A3, but it's a much better version. Again, yeah, now he just blunders made in one. Knight should actually be a very good move if I didn't have bishop h6 already, but yeah, let's play him again. He played... S he didn't play that fast, but he didn't play like super slow either. And I did beat him very fast, so... Okay, King's Gambit again. We play the very bossy systems, you know, the romantic spirit. So, okay, bishop c4, you know, queen h1, I have king f1. Queen h I have king f1. Okay, I should have played d4, that would have been a lot better. But I can do it next move, it's still fine. If d4, I'm going to just kick his pieces all over the board. But I think it's probably the reason why maybe it was better to uh, to play this move of uh, of d4 directly. Because if e5, he can go knight h5. And quite frankly, he could still play knight h5 and defend the pawn. But he doesn't. And I mean, this is the sort of position I very often get by moves. Then I play the king's gambit against, let's say, someone below 2000-ish in uh, chess.com. Because most people just have no idea really how to deal with this sort of opening. And... You can just always get, like, this really dominant center. Granted, I probably screwed up with castles, because now knight c6 and... Well, I thought I had screwed up because of knight g4, but then I can actually take on f7. So it actually is kind of okay for me in the end. Uh, well, I mean, if he doesn't play knight g4, though, I just can consolidate maybe queen to d3, and, you know, 
I can always play maybe like h3 in the worst case to, to defend, but I feel like I can maybe extract a little more from the position. But I'll play h3 because I don't really see a better move at this point. He does have rookie 8 and he can try to pressure this pawn, which is kind of an annoying idea, in fact. I guess I'd go rook a to f1, which might have been a better move on the previous move because it's not like it was really threatening knight g4. But anyways, if knight e4, I can go like rook f7. So in that case, I might actually meet rook e8 with rook e1 and put the rook opposite the queen because that can set up some really nice tactical ideas down the line. I mean, the good thing is he doesn't really have a threat at this moment. And, you know, I can reroute with like bishop f2 and get around to trying to attack with these pawns. It's kind of funny now he's trying to do this attack idea on me that I did on him before. But this version is certainly a lot less effective, I think, at least as far as I can tell. Because I can always run my king away this way in the worst case, and then his attack just peters out to nothing. In fact, I've quite tried... Ah, he's threatening this if I go bishop f track. I very nearly blundered mate in one. Fortunately, I caught myself in time before I could do something incredibly stupid. So rook f8, I'll just probably take queen e2, or even just king e2 directly, in fact. And I mean, he has a queen coming in, but it doesn't really do anything. I mean, I can even play a move like bishop g1 if I just want to play it safe and, you know, offer a trade to queens. He can take d4, but it's more important to just get rid of the queen so that you can convert the extra piece more quickly. And if you keep the queens, okay, he just blunders his queen. So thanks. And okay, bishop d4, knight e2, and, and I'm covered here. Yeah, I have that system of a down in my head right now. There's a song, uh, what's the song I'm thinking of? Because well, like, I haven't slept right, I can't even remember the song, even though I heard it like a million times. I actually had thought the guy had resigned for a moment, but he hadn't. So now Trump is making sure that the G1 bishop is protected. Hey dude wants to keep the tension. Let's just play rook g7 because rook f8. I've got rook f7 anyway to block. And I mean it's up so much material. It's kind of annoying that he's not resigning though. I thought he would show a little more respect than that. But okay I guess I'll mate you instead if you're not going to resign. And uh, yeah, I go for back rank mate with rook to g8 and queen takes g8. And pretty much anything else is kind of losing material anyway. So yeah, he is going to run his time down and I'm going to win on time. Which is of course the most great way to win. Because when you win on time, it means that the game took at least half of the allotted time for both players. And it takes forever to gain points in the league. You're not getting many trophies uh, for the hour. I mean, that'd be like a new sort of meme kind of thing, like, you know, how many trophies can you get in an hour? Okay, 468 points, not bad, but let's find a new opponent. Played Sky enough times. So we are at the two hour stage. I should really talk a bit less. Like, I'm afraid this race is starting to get sore. In fact, I might have finished this before three hours, because otherwise I might not be able to speak for the rest of the day. I'm probably going to be some wisecracker who says, well, you know, your wife is going to be thrilled with this and you're not able to speak for the whole day. But in fact, for me, it's kind of almost a reverse. Like probably, if anything, I don't actually talk enough uh, as such. Because like the, the you know, fact that you know, my wife is uh, is Vietnamese. You know, she's not so fluent in English. So, like if I talked a lot, she wouldn't really understand what I was saying anyway. So I kind of am more laconic as such. I'm not like in this video, like just talk, 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 talk. So anyway, so as you can see, like my opponent has sort of mixed a Grunfeld with g3, knight c3 in it. It just doesn't flow well, because now his knight's just going to get kicked all over the shop. So just really bad for white all around. If knight frame, I'm just going to go knight c6 and keep d4 in reserve. So I played d4 immediately, he had some like knight e5, and he could do some tricks. I don't know if it was any good, but he could try to use some knight f7 forks and stuff. But that sort of shows why you don't want knight c3, because A, it's going to get kicked away by the pawn, and B, you don't have c4 to challenge the center in a typical Grunfeld spirit. And now he just blunders the knight with queen a5. So he's from uh, Singapore. Yeah, actually, I remember Singapore, like, uh, you know, I've actually visited there many times. The first time I went was in, uh, in 2007, in fact. And uh, it was like for the World, uh, the world Youth, uh, is that what? The World Youth Chess Olympiad, that's what it was for. And actually, I remember, like, I was part of the Australian, like, we're called the Dream Team, because we had, uh, I think we were called the Dream Team at the time. I think there was also a Dream Team in 2012, I remember. But I guess, like, we are a really strong team. Like, I was on board five at that time because, well, there was some um, other players under 16 who are who are higher rated than me. 
uh, as such. So I was on board five, like basically as the reserve board. But I ended up actually playing quite a lot of games because one of the players was on a higher board, actually was a bit sick for the event and didn't have his best performance. But anyway, in that tournament, we uh, we did, did all right. I mean, we were actually in a good position like to play for first place. But in the last few rounds, we just didn't really do that well. I think we lost to India like two and a half, one and a half. I think we lost like one three. It was kind of funny because I remember I had like a stomach virus. I like, just, you know, threw up like not long before the game. And in spite of like, actually ended up getting like a wing position against guy Mishra Swyams, who actually is now a grandmaster today. So good job for him. But, uh, but yeah, even though... I was technically like winning. I was just like so exhausted because like I was so dehydrated and ended up just like basically just playing very safely, but not really putting the game away and the game ended in a draw. And then because I was so sick, I was rested for Philippines and that match also ended up being a 2-2 draw. And then we played like uh, Vietnam and that match also ended up being a, I think a 2-2 draw. So I forgot what place we came, but it was something like I think 5th or 6th, 7th or 8th. Might have been equal 5th or something from memory, but I'm really not sure. So, uh, yeah, that was a situation uh, with that tournament where, I mean, it was a fun experience. I mean, I remember going to the uh, to the zoo. So, uh, yeah, I have good memories of Singapore. I actually played good chess quite a few times because I went there in like 2000 and, uh, 2009 for the Commonwealth Championship. And in that tournament, I remember like, I came, was basically in the bottom half of the tournament. I actually ended up playing the winner of that tournament in round one and ended up losing that game. The guy just... Enrique Paciencia just completely dominated top eight and a half out of nine. But then I sort of come came back pretty well and actually ended up coming like uh, equal third place in the event, which I mean at that time like to big photo Komov was really, really cool uh, at the time. Uh, even though it was obviously a much weaker event than usual. I mean, I still had to beat some good players, like some IMs and stuff to, to get there. And actually I was like half a point off my first IM norm at that event where I was actually like winning in the last round against Daniel Fernandez, another player who went on to become a grandmaster but what happens like i remember that at the very end like the they just started packing up all the tables even though there were still games in progress so i mean it's like they did a very good job organizing the event for the most part other than this so i'm not going to be too critical but it did mean like that obviously that disrupted like both our concentrations but we was kind of in a losing position anyway so it didn't really matter that much whereas i was in a winning position and kind of had more to lose from a distraction but Anyway, long story short, I ended up like losing my concentration, making some dumb mistake, and basically game ended in a draw. And it was kind of funny because actually, I think if he won his game, like we we're both in if he won, he got an I am norm. If I won, I got an I am norm. But we end up drawing, and therefore neither of us got it. So it was kind of a, a funny situation like that. Okay, Night G3 is sort of a funny move. Whereas I haven't really talked much about this game, but there isn't even that much to talk about in fairness. I mean, just very classical moves. Kicking a knight all over the place, grabbing material, and. You know, so I'm not even bothering to play d6 because he can't really go d6 anyway. Well, okay, he tries to play it just after I say that, but the point is I am now winning a pawn. That being said, it's probably his best move anyway to try and free the bishop, but he shouldn't have played it with rook e8 because now he just blunders the rook. Okay, let's play this guy again. Actually, there's one thing as well that's kind of uh, interesting, like if you look at... I just don't know why this came into my mind, but if you think about like uh, women's chess, like the... Because, like, in most countries, like, the percentage of people who play, like, uh, of chess players, like, who are female, like, is relatively small. But, actually, there are certain countries that the percentage is a lot higher. And I think that the highest percentage one is actually Vietnam. And I'm not sure why exactly this case, but they have, like, a lot of quite strong uh, female players. Actually, one thing I kind of noticed was kind of interesting is that, actually, nearly all of the top players of Vietnam, like, both male and female, actually play the London system. Or at least have played it a bit in the past. Uh, as such, you know, probably, I guess, the coaches teach it here, but it's kind of interesting, even though I was, like, playing the London before I moved to Vietnam, it is true, like, after, you know, after meeting my wife, I actually started playing the London system still a lot more often, so it's kind of a funny, uh, a funny, like, unique feature, I guess, of the, the style that, like, a lot of the Vietnamese like to play the London and, well, I'm living in Vietnam and also have been playing the London in most of these games, so anyway, uh, so... It's something I'll probably try to weave into my book at some point, this story. But I'm not sure how exactly. I guess, you know, when I'm out of the same game with, like, Le Quang Liam or someone, then I can, uh, well, so I mentioned, like, the, the influence, I guess. Anyway, you can sort of see you can't take the bishop because, well, I've got the pin here and knight c3. Now, I think taking a run into queen g4, that's his trap. But I can play bishop g6. I mean, I could also have just gone queen e3, traded queens, and that's an easy win. But 
I'm keeping the queens on the board because his king is actually a lot weaker than mine. His king's in the center and can't really castle out of it. Even if he castles long, he's still really open up the position in front of the king. And I think it can even be very tricky and play e4 at this point. Because if he takes twice with the knight and with the queen, I go rook e8 and end up just winning the, the queen with the pin. So e4, kind of a nice move to play. Probably prepares way for e3, which he shouldn't have put the queen here because I have a little fork. So... And at this point, I would normally expect White to resign, but you never know what these guys like if they're going to resign or like move 10 or move 100. But okay, actually resigned quickly, so you know what, let's play again. So he's up for another one, which he is. Okay, uh, let's mix it up a little bit. And play the Knight C3, going for just E4 and dominating the center. And okay, I'll play Jababa London just to do something a little bit different. And yeah, C6 is a move I'm usually fairly happy to see in this case. I'll go bishop d3, and if he takes, then... Well, then that actually is very good for me, because then my knight c3 is not blocking the pawn, which is quite convenient. But bishop d6 is also kind of losing a tempo, so that also works well for me. I mean, it's basically kind of like a London, but with colors reversed. And I'm sort of all right with seeing the move queen b6. I mean, I'm thinking of playing knight a4, but then I can't really get in c4 anyway. But I still feel like it's a decent move, because it doesn't really have better than queen d8. Queen a5 is go b3, and the queen silks... Not so great on the a5 square, quite frankly. So he goes queen b4, just giving me a free tempo. It's almost giving me two free tempi, because I can go b4 as well. And that makes it very hard for him to get into c5 break later. I'm even considering like whether I want to try something very tricky here, like knight c5 is what I'm thinking. Because if he takes, I go b takes, and I get this nice uh, b file for the rook. And I can try to exert some pressure on this pawn, maybe, before he can develop. And okay, I got queen a5, just rook b1, and he has a bit of a hard time defending the pawn. b6, I got like 95, and it can jump in like this. And I don't really care if he takes my pawns, because I can still, you know, do stuff anyway. b5 is actually kind of somewhat clever, but I think 95 still a good reply. Because cb6 would sort of help him act for his pieces, but actually it's probably what I should have done anyway. I kind of saw some reasons why I should have done that. I think I'm... Yeah, I actually just missed a chance to trap his queen for free, because I played too fast. Uh, but okay, I guess I can always revert back to it, maybe. Uh, I actually sort of can't, really, because the queen is sort of getting out. So instead of winning a queen, I sort of have to settle for... I was going to say settle for just a winning endgame, but actually I'm still trapping the queen here. Because he has to go b4 to let the queen out, because otherwise, like, 95... Oh, he does have queen a4, so I guess I go rook b4 instead. Okay, so he's trying to grab this guy here. Let's just go rook b1 and renew the threat of rook to b4. So queen a4 does sort of free the queen, but the rising position is just strategically 100% lost for black. I guess go rook a1, take the pawn, and or even just rook b7, but okay, instead he just hangs the queen, and okay, at least because he played knight e4, he has queen c3, and he can reduce his losses to a piece, but it's still pretty bad. So anyway, so now I also have a, a nice little refreshing drink. Looks like, what, watermelon juice or something? At least I got it from my wife behind the scenes. You guys don't see this because I have my camera set an angle where you don't see everything that's going on outside. But okay, let's see what flavor is this. I'm guessing watermelon based on the color, but let's see if I'm right. I'm hoping it's something like strawberry or raspberry. That would be really nice. Oh, I absolutely love berries. Like, it's like if there's one food I kind of miss maybe a little bit in Vietnam, you know, I guess other than like Mexican food and stuff, it's probably like the sort of fruits, some of the fruits like the strawberries and the blueberries and the raspberries and the boysenberries you're know, absolutely amazing especially if you have them with yogurt just absolutely delicious but on the other hand they have some other fruits that you like, don't normally have like in australia like let's go to asian grocery or something you know things like durians and uh well it's like dragon fruit i mean the dragon fruit is so amazing like this lovely watery fruit just absolutely melts in your mouth especially if you get like the uh what's it called like the red dragon fruit is absolutely amazing like Whenever, like, my, you know, my family, like, buys me the, the red dragon, it's, like, my day is, like, automatically great. Like, I could, like, lose, like, a moron in four-player chess, and that would still be a good day if I had red dragon fruit. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, what flavor is this? What do you guys think? What flavor do you think this drink is? Might hold it a little bit longer in case you were, I don't know, doing something else while watching this. So, I'm going to guess watermelon. Let's see if I'm right. No, it's much better than watermelon. It's Oh, it's green tea. Oh my god, it's green tea. Oh, it's another of my favorite drinks. It's kind of funny, actually, because recently, like, my wife has said to me, like, I 
you're drinking too much for sort of things like green tea lately. Like almost like kind of a meme in the, in the house. Like green tea is one of my favorite drinks. That was like when I was what ten or eleven years old, and uh, but I think this this iced tea. I think it was uh, was Lipton iced tea. I think that we've got it was a Lipton or some other brand I like to drink back then. Oh wow, I got a, a high rated guy, and so I might want to focus a little bit more. But yeah, like ever since I just really enjoyed iced tea as like one of my favorite drinks. So here I'm playing it a little bit differently to a London. I mean, push before is still fine, but the idea is that here I can kind of uh, try to do some things. A G6 is not a move I've seen before. I mean, I could just play takes and G3, but I feel like I can do better than that. I have this gut feeling that E4 is a good move, but it's a very ballsy pawn sack. But I'm going to trust my gut and go for it. Question is, how do you follow this up? I'm thinking Queen E2 or Bishop 2. You know, I'm just going to play... As bishop c4 maybe goes d5 or something. But then his bishop is sort of stuck. I'm just going to play bishop d3 because I don't know what else to do. But I feel like with my lean development I should get pretty good compensation for the pawn here. You know, if you look at his piece, like he doesn't really have much development. And the rookie one is going to be a very annoying pin. You might have to play like f6 to deal it, but then it opens him up for h or h5. I'll start with this, just see how he defends, and then I'm going to go for the attack. So yeah, f6, I'm quite happy to, to see this move. I'm actually going to put the bishop back on d2, because I'm worried if I put it on f4 that maybe he was going to attack it. No, actually, since he can meet d6 with d5 and just leave this square weak, probably bishop f4 was better, but I don't think it makes that big of a difference. d5 is at least a solid move to make sure that uh, he has some space in the center. You know, maybe it's the reason I should have played d5 to take it away from him, but still I've got an attack going, and I think that at the very least in a blitz game, I think there should be very good compensation. I don't think knight d7 is that good, because then after rook e6, he can't really challenge my uh, challenge my rook. So I'm thinking of rook e6 here. Queen b5 is actually a very interesting move as well, because I don't think he can cover everything. Like, if he plays e6, I go queen c6, and he's kind of losing the pawn very quickly. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Maybe it's even better to play h6 first, but I'm going to keep it in reserve for a move, just to see what he does. Nothing out, nothing out h6 that then it does trap the bishop in. Now, one move I didn't see was c5, but luckily queen c6, and I still get the pressure against this. So queen c6, and now he has to give back the pawn, as far as I can tell. If he goes knight b8, maybe I will... Okay, so he does this instead. Mm, I could take and go rook h7 and just play for compensation, but I do feel like taking the pawn is kind of the rational decision. But I'm going to go h6 first, just so the bishop is really badly placed before he can try and improve its placement. And while I have a feeling there might be a better move than queen c7, I don't see it, so I'm just going to take. Now here he might have some counterplay. So instead I'm going to play, I'm thinking queen b7, or queen f4 actually, because then I'm throwing some knight g5, which is not so easy for him to deal with. I should go like king g8 or something, and now queen d6 maybe, just put the queen on a better square of a tempo. And, well, I have a few ideas in that case. You know, king f7, I can go, like, rook h4. I was kind of considering this in an earlier position. And it might be a good rook lift to just use the pin to my advantage. The other idea was just to double on the e-file, which may actually be a better move, objectively. Then when I see a sort of crave idea, I kind of so I just can't help but play it, you know. You know, see this really great-looking idea, and you think, even if it doesn't necessarily work as well as something else, you just it looks so good, you just have to try it. I just have a feeling it often comes up quite a lot among good players. Rook g8 I think is a mistake because of rook f4 and ah, I want to go g5 and I don't have this trick. That's actually kind of clever. So i got to go rook g4. Yeah, well, there's like fruit in my mouth, so I, so I start talking funny. I'm going to keep the queens on the board because I'm going to go like queen h5, f4. I think his counterplay on my king is somewhat slow at the moment. Though that means maybe give him enough time he can try to do something. But okay, I might move my knight. What do I want? Maybe I move it to g1. Just give him f5 though. So I might go queen h5 first. My only fear is that my knight might not be... My, my pieces kind of look really weird on these squares, but... If I get an f4 and start to open the position, I feel like it's kind of alright. So okay, take a... Okay, he's threatening mate, so let's cover it. Okay, so what next? Queen c4. I want to cover like this. That's kind of smart. So let's go, king b1, he has this. Yeah, I've kind of misplayed this a little bit, I think. 
but what to do maybe just take anyway or I mean I'm kind of stuck in this position whatever I do I guess a3 is at least solid but I can actually sort of play a bit quicker because I'm now a bit behind on time so queen d3 let's just take f5 rook f4 I'm just gonna flag the guy basically ah he has this trick okay let's force the queens off And, oh, that's sneaky. Okay. I'm not playing this very well whatsoever, but, yeah, just trying to be tricky. Oh, he's blundered his queen. So being tricky paid off. Yay. Yeah, that was kind of lucky. Okay, actually, it's sort of weird. Like, when I play these unrated games against these players, like, in unrated, I seem like just beat these guys. Like, why what I do if it's rated? I don't know why. Like, maybe I just... I'm a lot more relaxed in these unrated games. Or I'm more relaxed when I'm streaming. It's probably a combination of both. Because that's when I stream, I seem to... Uh, Seem to play a bit better overall when I stream, is why I observed, on average. <clears throat> like, even if it's not like a bad, in bad form, I seem simply like almost break even on rating, so that's kind of cool. Okay, taking a while to get the next opponent. For some reason. Like, it's something I kind of noticed, like, completely crazy. It's been like two, over two hours, I haven't gone to the toilet. It's not like I drink so much water when I'm um, in the day, just out of habit, that. I'm like going to like every half an hour to an hour. But yeah, this time I've been able to hold it in very well. It's like what you say about like the, you know, the like Dogecoin meme coins, like, you know, like, like H-O-D-L. Uh, and I like hold on for dear life. Uh, so D4, go, go, probably Bishop E2. Like even if they, let's say, just play something like Knight F6 and Knight D5. The server I'm about to play is actually one you can play very easily against a Scandinavian. If you're playing someone raid below, let's say 2,000 feet, I think you're almost certainly going to get a very nice advantage out of the opening just playing this setup against pretty much everything that they do. Of course, here it's a lot better because I managed to grab two pawns completely for free. And he realized it because he resigned really fast. Let's see if he wants to play again and resign really fast again. Apparently not. Maybe what I'm like, he was not playing, he didn't realize he was playing, and I thought, oh, I'm playing a GM, I'm two pawns down, let's just give up. Which is not completely unreasonable in all fairness, even if in his shoes I would play on. To the bitter end. Again, taking a bit of time to get a game. It's honestly because of the time, because I get the time right now that I'm recording is just 10:28 a.m. in Vietnam. So I mean, it's kind of late at night for for Americans, and you know, so it makes sense. Chess.com is a U.S. Uh, server. You know, their headquarters are, are in the USA. I think Palo Alto, California, if I remember correctly, but I could be could be wrong on that. Uh, so. Anyway, so I'm playing the line actually that I covered my How to Beat E4, E5 course, which, uh, yeah, you can find on my uh, on my website. I think it's uh, Max. Well, I'll just put it in the description. It'll be easier that way. You can find it from there, How to Beat E4, E5. But this is one of the lines I recommended because, like, with this Scotch uh, with this Scotch Gambit approach, like, it's very tricky because my opponents actually played it somewhat reasonably at this point. But a lot of the times, like, you're just very easy player. Like, you know, you kick the knight away. You, well, you could also play knight d2, but you can kick knight with tempo, get a nice amount of space. The bishops kind of look kind of dumb in this position. and Well, I mean, it's not like from a computer perspective you get an advantage, but I think it's like in chess, like if you play the main lines, even then like black is still going to equalize if they find all the right moves. So there is a certain merit at some levels to playing kind of more shortcut sort of openings that, yeah, the top ground of black equalize more easily, but... At an amateur level, the ideas are very straightforward. Like, it's very easy to understand what it is you're trying to do. Like, here it's very obvious that you're going, like, F6 and you're just going to try and mate their king. Like, you don't need to be a grandmaster to understand this. And you also need to be a grandmaster to kind of execute this sort of plan. Like, knight c3, rook e1, rook e3. I mean, this is not exactly complicated attacking ideas in this sort of position. Uh, having that space range definitely makes it much easier to make the attack happen. And you also notice I haven't really let black get in c5 and d4, because if they're able to get that in, then definitely that bishop would come to life and black would have a very strong initiative. But I just can't do that because my queen is blocking. And now with this rook lift, I'm bringing my queen rook in the attack. I mean, both e6 and f6 are tempting ideas in these sort of positions, but I'm wondering if I can maybe delay the decision a bit. Maybe something like rook f4. Because I've got bishop d7, I'm going to go b4 just anticipating c5. Because I think that's his only really active idea. You know, sometimes you don't have an easy way to break through in the position. Sometimes you can just play some improving move that stops their main idea or the reason why the direct plan doesn't work and hope that they make some bigger mistake while you're kind of treading water. 
So now after B5, you can sort of see that this is kind of nice because, well, if you go to C5, I can take on Passant and my queen keeps its very active position on D4. Now, if I were to play rook h4 too soon, he might go queen c1 and start giving me a lot of very annoying checks, like check, 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 check. But instead, I can maybe play like this h3, king h2, or even maybe h4, rook g5, and just kind of keep up that pressure and not let the black queen get back into place so easily. So he goes king f8, and that does make e6 a lot more tempting, because it means that it comes with a check. So okay, uh, but I'm going to go h4 first, because he doesn't really have an active plan anyway. And if f6, then I can just go e6, and I have this monster past pawn that he can't really get out of his throat. You know, it's like I used to say in the old chess books I was reading in early travel, I had to say, like, a bone in the throat, and yeah, it was just somehow always stayed in my memory after that. It was a very big reader as a kid. Like, I think I read, I think over the course of my life, I'm sure I've read, like, at least a thousand chess books cover to cover, and that's probably a more conservative number in reality. Um, I mean, definitely read over a thousand books total like on different topics but nowadays i don't actually read that much like i read some online articles but a lot of the way i learned stuff was actually just through like different videos as such and some from my own experience so i mean i think like i know i should read more than i do but i just sort of yeah and i like just prioritizing other things as such uh so anyway uh like i got in the habit of reading chess books when i was young but that habit didn't extend quite as much to books on other things like i know when i was really young for example like i wasn't really that into fiction. Like, for some reason, I wasn't into fiction as much as a lot of other people in uh, in my school. I was much more into, like, more factual, you know, non-fiction works. So, uh, so yeah. It's all fine. When I did actually spend the time to read fiction, I actually really enjoyed it a lot. But it wasn't something I naturally kind of reached out for, if that makes sense. So. It's a really funny way this game could end, actually. If it goes rook f6, I have queen d8, mate. It's kind of cool, but you resigned instead. Actually, no, he lost on time. Okay, it was a bit of a long game, so let's find another opponent to play against. Man, this is a good drink. Like, with green tea, like, I could go on for, like, 10 hours. Except that my voice would probably die before then. But, you know, we, uh, we go as long as we can. Okay, because I'm not really getting a game, I'm just going to take a short break. And I will be back in a few moments. So after that toilet break, let's find a new opponent. See what we got. Maybe it'll be a little bit faster now that I, uh, well, now I wait a little bit. It got a little bit tired. There's a part of me that wants to just like have a second win, like just go five hours video. And there's a part of me that wants to wrap it up fairly soon just to, you know, uh, maybe record some other videos and stuff for some other ideas I have. I'm gonna play Nims with Sicilian and you can see it worked really well because he he thought I was going to play like uh, d6 or knight c6 and he pre-moved c3. And the result is now I'm just up a pawn for absolutely nothing. So it's kind of funny how it works so well. This jewels are... I feel like that picture is probably of like some sort of movie character, but I have no idea who it is. Kind of one thing actually with uh, with uh, like films, like, you know, when it comes like to video length, I always feel like the... Anyway, like a nice round number, like 230.00. It just sounds like... It just looks really cool. I don't know why, but like for long videos, like if it has, I don't know, some random number, like let's say three hours, 44 minutes and, you know, 56 seconds, I'm somehow a bit less likely to watch it. But if it's like a nice round number, it just somehow looks better to me. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I used to be kind of a bit obsessed with numbers as a kid. Like I remember like I learned the timetables off by heart at what, uh, I think it was uh, four years of age. Like the way I learned it was like very... Uh, very kinesthetic, actually, like just bouncing on the trampoline, just like saying the, the numbers over and over again, just worked really well for me. So um, there was something else I was going to share, which I already completely forgot. I guess it doesn't matter that much. So I was thinking I was worried about Queen H5, and then I realized that I have Rook takes C2, which already tells you how long I've been playing, that uh, just didn't come to my mind in 0 0.1 seconds. So okay, let's not let him play Bishop to D4. And I mean, it's just a French where I'm up a pawn, and his position just doesn't make any sense, really. So I'm keeping my bishop on this nice active diagonal. It's not like you can trap it with b4, b5 or anything like this. My plan is just going to be, you know, probably g6. It might look a bit weakening, but he's not really in a position to exploit it. Because queen h6 I can just even move the rook and go bishop to f8. And you know, even a plan like pushing the d-pawn looks quite good now that the queen has vacated the center. So that's the news in Frenchtown. 
But yeah, I realized that, you know, I didn't play the French defense initially. But you can see we kind of got this sort of structure. And now bishop b4, yeah, he couldn't go rook e2 because the bishop was attacking. But now bishop d2 and he can't defend everything at the same time. Or if he tries to, I just take it, basically. So a5, kind of desperate. I think if I just keep the tension, like queen to b5 or something is fine. Like he was trying to like bait the bishop, like sort of bribe, like the rook saying, oh, please don't take me. I'll give you a paw. Like this guy's a little guy. No one's going to miss him. No one's going to notice that he's dead. But now nah, we, we got bigger fish to fry. And oh, he played bishop a3. I actually noticed that he moved at first. And I feel like I have some sort of clever tactic. Oh yeah, I have rook c2, of course. Weak back rank ideas. That's a cool way to finish the game. And he resigns. He wants a rematch. Uh, I want to try wins a bit more quickly. Yeah, this is going to be the last game. Uh, depends how quick the game is. Or how quick I get a game. Now, if it finishes in, I don't know, three, less than three minutes, I'd probably play one more. Otherwise, it's probably going to be the last one. Yeah, probably like, it's only like they have these sort of fruits in the drink, so it's not like just green tea, but it tastes really good with like these sort of, uh, I'm not sure like what the actual name of the, like the sort of, actually fruits are wrong, it's like a, a sweet, I don't know what the name of the sweet is, but it kind of like, uh, kind of a bit like a gummy bear, but not quite the same as a gummy bear, but like a, well, it's not quite the same texture, like it's like a gummy bear, but more, uh, what's what I'm looking for. But like more kind of soft as such, like not sort of hard, but just a very soft kind of gummy bear is sort of what it tastes like. That's the uh, close I can describe it. Taking a really long time to get in the point. Oh, just like I say, we get a 2 300. All right, go for a knight f3 move order. And this is why I love playing London against these guys because, yeah, he's playing semi Slav, which is not the best system against the London because then your bishop on c8 is very passive compared to normal lines and. Well, you can see I just have a good version of a uh, of a queen's gambit uh, declined. Now, probably objectively, it's better just to play bishop d3 or bishop e2 and just let them take c4. But I'm sort of playing this kind of as a bit of a practical approach, trying to keep a little bit more tension in the position and try to make... And it kind of paid off because he played his bishop c7 concession. And I mean, I could play a move like a3, but I don't think it's going to be that useful. No one's going to let them play dc4 and b5 or... Apparently he's not doing it. Okay. So uh, I can tell you he really doesn't have a good plan. Yeah, e5 I think is a move I'm very happy to see here. I'm going to take here first and then I'm going to take e5. Unless knight b5 might actually be even better. I'll play knight b5. And it feels like this has just got to be very good somehow for white. I mean, in the absolute worst case, I can just take everything and put a knight on d4 and just be much better. I mean, maybe it was true, I might have had some benefit to having now in c3 to attack, but having this position also has its advantages. I mean, I could go bishop f3. I bishop f3 is very careless, because you can go bishop g4 and trade the bishop. But I wanted to try to attack his pawn and maybe try to provoke a move like bishop d7 like he played, and then just put the knight on this outpost, where I just have very nice control of the position. The queen b3, I'm attacking this pawn, and, well, the plan is just to kind of build up the position steadily. Uh, to 94, he's offering it as a sacrifice on b7. And I don't really see anything wrong with taking it, quite frankly. Rook b8, let's go like queen to a7, rook b2, rook b1, and I'm still a pawn up as such. Like, I was even considering, like, you could take on e4 at some moment. And just say, well, you don't really have, uh, have any real counterplay. Because d4, knight c6 is a nice trick to win the, uh, to win some material with the pin. Of course, he sees this and plays rook e4, but now I can go rook b1, and at least I don't have to worry about any knight d2 sort of tricks that might have happened otherwise. And also, it's kind of nice, like, the queen and knight really coordinate well with the queen and bishop, and black rooks are maybe a little discombobulated at this point. I see a guy is from Argentina. Okay. I think in Argentina, it's... Uh, I'm not really good with the time zones, like, with Latin America. Like, I'm pretty good with the time zone most part, but I never really had, like, many... Uh, Latin American sort of students, such at least like in that sort of uh, in that zone. So I'm a bit less familiar like what the time zones are, but I think they're like a bit earlier than uh, than the US for the most part, if I remember correctly. 
I could be completely wrong on that, but that's sort of my guess from watching different live tournaments and when they tend to be on. So, anyway. Like, my guess would be it was probably early evening in Argentina at the time that it is now. So, anyway. Well, to talking about the times I could talk about the position and say that, well, A3, Rook B7, and this is probably going to be my winning plan. Let's do it the active way and start with Rook B7 in order to keep a bit more pressure on him. If he goes Bishop B8, then, then I'd probably go A3. It kind of works better in that version when he can't maybe try some sort of sack on me at some point. Now, Rook E7 actually runs into a tactical... Oh, actually, he's very cunning. If Knight C6, he can go Queen C8 and try to back rank mate. But I go Rook C7. Bishop C6, Rook E7 works. Well, that was an interesting puzzle, but yeah, this, uh, this works for me. I'll be quite impressed if he finds Queen C8 because it's a very tricky attempt. But it just doesn't work because of rook to c7 is the key. And basically it keeps control of everything. Okay, it's kind of a fun example to conclude. Actually quite a an instructive one as well, I think, for showing how to play. Well, both against like the semi stuffs up and showing why it's not as good for black. Because like you want to play knight d7 in these positions as black. But then if your bishop is still here, it's like you can't do it. And if you play like bishop g3, you're just kind of improving the white structure, which is a pretty common theme that London and I talk about in my London book, which at the time this recording is unpublished, but maybe if you're watching this video much later, you might, well, it might well be available, whether it's on Amazon Kindle or on my website or wherever I decide to publish it as such. So, uh, yeah, that's, I think, a good moment to wrap up this video. Glad that you guys got all the way to the end and enjoyed it. Great work. Hopefully you learned some things as well as being entertained by my commentary, both chess and non-chess. And I guess on that note, I will see you guys in the next video. So I uh, do comment below with, uh, well, what should a comment be about? You no, know, just comment about like whatever you, uh, whatever you feel like, basically. Like, you know, if there was some moment in a game, like some movie, like that was really cool to you or some moment was like, oh, I thought like this was going to happen. And like, so yeah, just like say one moment from the video, like one game that was kind of fun share that moment and uh yeah and i was like if you put a timestamp as well it means that if someone just say wants to go like to the highlights they can like click the timestamp and see ah oh, so this is what what he's talking about uh yeah that's all for me so see you in the next youtube video good luck with your chess get out of here